Okay, we'll try it again. Good afternoon, everyone. This is a meeting of the Preservation Board for Monday, June the 26th. We call a roll and establish who is here. Commissioner Hamaker, are you here? Yes. Commissioner Hamilton, are you here? Here. I, I'm Buridan's ass. I'm directly between <coughs> two bales of hay, and I'm going to starve. Okay. Commissioner Hamilton, are you here? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Killeen, are you here? Yes. Alderman Narayan, are you here? Yes. Have I overlooked any commissioners who are present? Okay. We have a quorum present. Has anybody who is present read the minutes for May 22nd, 2023? And if so, do I hear a motion to approve them? I move that we approve the minutes. Is there a second? I second. Motion made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor of approving the minutes for May 22nd, 2023, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Are you <laughs> it looks like you might be trying to oppose No, I'm, I'm eating. <laughs> okay, those, min those minutes are approved. Thank you, commissioners. Going first to a, what, anybody take a look at the agenda? Does anybody need to recuse themselves from consideration of any of these items? Uh, yes. Okay, which um, ones? Line item uh, F and G. Do we have appropriate numbers of votes if he abstains on those? We will. We will? Okay. Thank you. The order okay? Everyone? Is uh, everyone aware fine. that we will go into closed session? And D also, excuse me. And D. E. D. Yeah, everything in Forest D, Park. D and E? E, e F, G. Okay. Is there anything you, you don't feel conflicted to talk about? <laughs> Just, just Forest Park. Okay, so this will be our agenda and the order of our agenda. Let's begin with agenda item A. Hey, everybody. Hi, Bob Bettis with staff. I'll tell the truth. Can you hear me okay? There we go. Yeah, Bob. <clears throat> Excellent. Okay, so first up, the prelim for a new construction of a two-story four-fam on Accomac in Fox Park. Okay. Uh, he's going to pass down to his thing. <laughs> Okay, this is the site in question. I'll give some context here. It's the uh, north side of Accomack, just to the west of Jefferson and east of Ohio. It's a larger parcel than usual, and I'll show you in a minute why that's the case. And again, here's the parcel. It's this wooded area to the left. Here is some street level context looking west on Accomack. The uh, block is a mix of two family and four family, um, two story brick buildings for the most part. And uh, looking east on Accomack, same thing, see more same context, two story brick buildings, um, four family, smaller massing, two fams, standard massing for buildings. Um, I'm going to show you this picture now because the building in question is a little larger given the larger site. So I'm going to show you within the block, within the neighborhood, um, you see these kind of buildings elsewhere in the block or the neighborhood that have larger massing, but not on this block in particular. Uh, historically, there was a four family on the, on the block, I'm sorry, on the parcel on the right that was demolished. On the left, you'll see that it was always an empty parcel. So um, the owners combined the lots recently, that's why I have this really large parcel. Here is the site plan of the building. It does align with the neighboring buildings. Here is the front elevation. Um, brick on the front, two-story building. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. The owners were awesome. They worked well with us in terms of getting this um, design refined. We'll have you with how it turned out, and so is Fox Park, it turns out. Um, this is the building with the model example. Now, the massing's a little bit different, but the, uh, the, you know, they drew the design inspiration from the model example. And we think it's an appropriate model example. Um, Fenestration is good, cornice is good, porch, all that jazz. The sides are all brick, so that's nice. There's uh, not much of a return, like eight feet between the buildings, 
but as of now, it's brick on the sides of the building. And the rear has a hardy siding. Uh, in Streetscape, uh, you see uh, it, it, it lines up pretty well with the block. The block has kind of a bowl shape to it. It kind of slopes from uh, east to west. So it's kind of a weird um, lot, but this does show pretty close how they are going to uh, site on the block with the neighboring properties. Okay, so going through the ordinance, um, we think that it complies for the most part with everything. The uh, model example is appropriate. Uh, the site, it lines up with the neighboring properties. Setback is appropriate. Um, the proportion is appropriate. The uh, solid void meets the uh, threshold of 25%. They'll do a red bricks, so that complies. The two things that do not comply are the massing component. Um, again, it's the, this block does not have these large massing buildings. However, we think, given the large site, um, we think it's appropriate, even though it does not comply. It does not derail the uh, project. We think it still complies overall, and the building is, it, you know, it, the site, it, it fits well on the site. Um, there's also one other part that does not comply. It says that if it's a large um, building, the building should step down at some point. And after looking at the site, how it slopes to step this building down halfway would really look odd. And the neighborhood agrees that to meet that one part, it would look unusual to have this step down. So we think that this really is the, uh, the best design and massing for the building. So we do recommend approval um, with our usual language that we work with the, the details. We do not have a letter of support from Fox Park. It was supposed to be coming in. I heard from Jay Reeves in the neighborhood um, who said, Bob, I'm going to send you a letter of support. But we did not get the letter in. So something was happening on their end. But I do have correspondence saying that we're going to support staff's recommendation as submitted. So any questions for me? Commissioner's questions? Um, a couple for you, Bob. Um, the front porches, do you know what the material is? Uh, we're going to be going wood, I, I assume. The uh, applicants are here, if you want to get down to the nitty-gritty, but I thought it was going to be oh, wood. Oh, okay. I, I'll ask them directly. Oh, that's cool. I think it, I think it was wood, though, for the porches, to match the model example. Okay. And are you um, satisfied with the detailing of that uh, concrete out front, the foundation? It looks a little schematic. I mean, it, it, they do allow for a poured concrete foundation mm -hmm. in the code, so uh, we can work them on to make sure it looks like a limestone finish or okay. something that will be appropriate. As you notice on the example, it's a really small kind of a plinth on the model example, so um, it's a pretty um, you know, sedate um, foundation on the example, but we can work with them on that design. If it's just one of those things where that's the one detail that gets lost on some of these. Sure. It's just a, if we could get that right. Yeah. Absolutely. So, looks but like they, a nice were, project. But they were great, even like up to the, um, the windows, over the porch, the second floor, those will be a Jefferson door to match the model example. So they've done every little detail we've asked them to do. They've been great to work with. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions for staff? Okay, where are the applicants? What are your names? <laughs> My name is Jacob Wollinger. I'm the owner of Scapula Real Estate. Jacob, could you go to the podium so we can hear you better? There's a microphone up on the podium. Are you Anthony? Yes. My name is Jacob Bullinger. I'm the owner of Scapula Real Estate, and I'll let Anthony introduce himself. I'm Anthony Aguas, and I work for Jacob Bullinger and Scapula Real Estate. Okay, let's, uh, see if, let's see if we have any questions for you. Commissioners, questions? Yeah. Uh, well, that material on the front, is it, it's wood, is that what you're going for? Painted wood on the front uh, porches? Yes, sir. Okay. Further questions, commissioners? Okay, thank you all very much. Commissioner Colleen, have you got a motion? Um, yes, I do. I move that the Preservation Board grant preliminary approval. Is that what we're going for preliminary on this yeah, one? Yes, preliminary approval. Preliminary approval to this project as designed uh, with details and materials to be worked out with staff. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Okay, Commissioners, I'm going to call a roll, noting that Commissioners Allen, Richardson, Robinson and Hamilton have come in. I've already been here. Now you can vote twice. Okay. <laughs> Roll call. Commissioner Allen, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Hamaker, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Hamilton, do you vote yes or yes. no? Yes. Commissioner Kelly, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Alderman Narayan, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Richardson, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Robinson, do you vote yes or no? Yes. 
The chair abstains on this vote. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven yeses and one abstention. The motion carries. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you guys. We appreciate it. Nice Thank project. You. Thanks. Thanks really. Look forward to working with you guys <laughs> as it goes through also. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. The meeting will now listen to appeals of director's denials. We'll do things a little differently. I will ask people to state their names, affirm that they're telling the truth, and introduce for the record all the evidence, material, and testimony that they think that we should consider. Calling agenda item B. Um, this is 1901 Newhouse Avenue. Um, I need to enter into the record the ordinance 64689 um, is amended by 64925. Um, the Hyde Park Certified Local Historic District Ordinance 57484 PowerPoint agenda in my presentation. I'm Andrea Gagan and I swear to tell the truth. Proceed. Okay, this is the building in question. And just um, something to show where it is. Um, it is a, the corner of 19th Street and Newhouse in the Hyde Park Historic District. Um, the applicant has applied to retain 11 vinyl windows, um, five of which are on street facing facades, all installed without a permit. Um, and a few of these windows were installed in openings that had been previously blocked down. Um, and the exterior trim has been wrapped uh, with aluminum coil stock on most of the windows. Um, this is just some of the first story or the first front elevation windows. Um, two on the second story and then one on the first story. Um, the second story looked like they have been blocked down a little bit at the top um, and maybe a little bit at the sides too. Um, the one on the first story has been blocked down even more. Um, it was originally a taller window um, and uh, it was there was a, a pre-existing window in that opening but we would have had them open the it back up to the original size if they had applied for a permit. Um, the uh, several, like as, as I said, several windows are not installed the same size as the original openings. Um, vinyl is not allowed material for replacement windows in Hyde Park Historic District. Um, Furthermore, installed windows are not similar in size, detail, and material to the original windows. The aluminum coil stock covering the brick mold does not maintain the architectural details or materials of the building. This is the side elevation um, where two windows were installed. Um, the one on the second floor, um, again, was installed in a previously blocked down um, opening. Um, and the other one, the one on the first story, uh, Phil's, it was it's probably an altered opening at some point, but it would the size would be okay. Um, it and it has not doesn't have any aluminum wrapping as far as I know. Um, this is just some context across Newhouse and looking south on 19th Street. And um, looking southwest and actually this would be south. In northeast, northwest on Newhouse. And this is northeast on Newhouse and um, kind of catty cornered from the building. Act. So, um, 1901 Newhouse is located in the Hyde Park Local Historic District. Um, the vinyl windows were installed without a permit. Um, some of the windows are installed in previous lockdown openings um, that are not the same size as the original openings. Um, that vinyl is not allowed material uh, and does not replicate historic windows. And the aluminum coil stock uh, does not main the maintain the architectural details and materials of the building. Um, the Hyde Park Neighborhood Association sent an email and is not in support of the windows. It is not as they do not comply with the Hyde Park Certified Local Historic District Standards. 
Um, the Cultural Resources Office recommends that the Preservation Board uphold the director's denial as the proposed one does not comply with the Hyde Park Certified Local Historic District standard. Any questions? Mm -mm. Okay. Is this the email? Yes. Are you entering it into the record? Oh, uh, yes. <clears throat> okay, questions for Ms. Gagan? Commissioners? <laughs> okay. Are the appellants present? Come on up. Welcome. Good. How are you? I'm good. How are you guys? Fine. Thank Thanks you. for having us. My name is Tom Herndon. I'm the sales manager for Window World, and we were the ones that installed the windows on this property. And do you affirm that your testimony will be the truth? Yes, sir. Okay. And is there an address at which we can reach you? I'm sorry? Is there an address at which we can reach you? Yes. 3600 Ryder Trail South, Earth City. Perfect. Thank you. Hello. I'm Faye McFadden, and I was the real estate agent for the person that bought the property. Fine, but I'm here. Will your testimony be the truth? Absolutely. Okay, proceed. So the, uh, the owner lives in Texas, which is why we're here today. So, um, look, Andrea will tell you that we're, we do our due diligence when we go into these historic neighborhoods. We really do, and I'm sure she could attest to that. We're constantly emailing her just to make sure what we can do, street facing versus alley inside. I will admit we missed this one, okay? But what we're looking for here is a little bit of leniency with the product that we've got in there. The, uh, the homeowner was granted occupancy because of the work that we've done and because of the work they've done to make this property, property uh, livable. Um, you know, and I heard a little bit about the, the vinyl wrapping that we do on the outside of the windows. Um, you know, and I went down the street today just because I wanted to see what I was looking at. I was not the one that sold the windows on this property. I drove down the street today just to look and I made a list of six addresses that have vinyl wrapping around the brick mold, okay? So, you know, if it's something to where, you know, if we have to take the vinyl wrapping down, if we could leave the windows and take the vinyl wrapping down, we'll put some kind of wood up there. It doesn't seal it the way that we've got it here, but, you know, that was something we would, we would look into doing. But, um, you know, one other thing I will add, uh, two blocks up the street, uh, I made note and actually took a picture of a house that's got all brand new vinyl windows all the way around it with the with the same, it's probably even more pronounced vinyl wrapping around it than, than what we do. So um, we just ask that you, you know, grant us uh, leniency here to, to keep the windows, but we'll, you know, take whatever you guys decide. Ms. McFadden, you have anything to add? Yes, sir. Thank you for being here. And we're sorry that this caused a problem. I ain't trying to be bothered like that for real. <laughs> but anyway, when we, um, when I represented Ken, KKE Investments, in purchasing this property, it was really, 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 really bad. And so we got in touch with Window World, got in touch with the roofer, plumbers, heating and cooling, everything that needed to be taken care of concerning this property. As far as we knew, everything was fine till you got the email from the lady across the alley. And she was coming through all the time, well, you can't have this much trash in the dumpster. Lady, go mind your business. But anyway, um, we didn't know at the time when they were putting the windows in that the vinyl wrapping was a problem until Wendell World reached out to me and said that there was an issue because of the vinyl around the windows. So I reached out to the alderman who recommended that I speak to the young lady over there to find out what needed to be done. She instructed us to write a letter, but it was going to be denied, and then we'd end up in front of you guys, and here we are. I drove through the neighborhood. I didn't know that, you know, I needed to be here until maybe a half an hour, 45 minutes before I showed up here because we were out of town. So, you know, I came, but I did go through the area and there are homes all up and down the block. 
across the alley, all the way on the same block that the older person lived on, all around Hyde Park that had vinyl windows in them. Some of them were sitting inside wood casings, so they possibly have put new windows around in the original wood that is still in the homes. And again, if the vinyl is a problem and they can just take the vinyl wrapping out and just restore or put the new wood in there, then Mr. Hopkins, who is KKE Investments, will do what he needs to do in order to be able to be on the correct side of the law or the preservation department or whoever is in control. But we did have the city inspections done on it. And uh, the two units upstairs passed for occupancy and we just got the emails on them last week. I pulled one up before I got here. But the one on the first floor didn't pass yet because whoever painted it did a bad job on the inside. So they said to paint, repaint the inside and do some tuck pointing. And that's where we stand with this. So it's in your hands. And whatever you decide, we'll just have to work with that. Commissioners, questions for the appellants? One question. Yes, sir. Uh, and I really appreciate the investment in Hyde Park, but did Mr. Hopkins from KKE Investments LLC, the member of did he ever, uh, to your knowledge, reach out to the Hyde Park Neighborhood Association? He, no, he was out of the country. Okay. He doesn't live here, and how I got connected to him is his family is a member of my church, okay. and they needed a realtor to help him, so here I am. Okay. So I was confused. So the report says that the wrapping is aluminum. The wrapping is? It's vinyl. And the windows are vinyl. Yeah, it's a PVC right. coated aluminum. And did you get a permit for everything else, or you didn't pull a permit for these windows? We didn't know we had to. And like I said, we, we do our due diligence. You know, the owner of our company, if we know that we have to do something in a certain area, you better do it right or else. We just, we missed this one. Yeah. And we didn't know that we were in a historic district. It was it was an oversight on our part. Because you guys haven't done the work at Hyde Park before? I, my customer service team missed that it was Hyde Park. Because, like I said, we, we email the Cultural Resources Office probably daily. She could probably speak to it more than I could. But we're, we always do our due diligence. Uh, you know, Webster Groves, Creve Corps, Maryland Heights, uh, University City. I mean, I've got a, I've got six pages <coughs> of uh, codes and stuff we have to abide by in all these different communities. And I have five stores, you know, between Kansas City and, and Peoria, Illinois, I own five window worlds. So, you know, it, it's hard to keep track of all this stuff. My customer service, I went to them this morning because I didn't know I was going to be here. Uh, the other gentleman was sick this morning. But I went and checked with them. They're like, yeah, we're, we missed it. We're sorry. We, we absolutely missed this one. But, you know, the, the day we found out that we missed it, you know, we were on the phone, you know, trying to get this resolved. So we're, we, we most certainly weren't trying to hide anything, as you can tell by the stickers in our windows. Yeah. Did you, you said the, where's the owner in Houston or something? I'm sorry, what right now? Where's the owner? He's in Texas. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, unfortunately, I, well, I, can I give commentary? Just, a, just questions for no, I don't have a question. You can say, don't you think. <laughs> don't, don't you think. I'm, I deal, I'm a realtor also, so I deal with a lot of, you know, California, New York people, investors. And part of, part of doing business on their part is doing their due diligence uh, with codes and guidelines and preservation districts. So I understand it may have been. A misstep on your part, but it was also the owner's due diligence to to research that. In my opinion, don't you think? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that, that worked out perfect. This this is the first. I, I've been with yeah. the company for 13 years, yeah. and this is the first time that it's happened. No, yeah. So yeah, we. Okay, commissioner. For, further questions for the appellant? Okay, thank you all very much. Commissioner Richardson, have you got a motion? Can I ask a question? Is that, have we had like yes. a world issue before? Yes. Um, but uh, just a point of clarification that you gentlemen on the end, but Commissioner Allen and Commissioner Trump said your microphones don't work, so we do speak if you can speak loudly so that they can be audible. Have we had window world issues before? Yes, we have. Um, not too many recently um, because they do 
I mean, I get multiple emails a day from them asking, uh, you know, if something's in a historic district, there are any restrictions on different buildings. Um, I did not get one for this building. Um, but I, I, there's only one I can think of that was maybe a few years ago that was in Shaw, I think, which they took care of. I mean, they did fix it. The issue here is both the wrap and then the windows themselves, right? Yes. Like the wrap yeah. doesn't just take care of itself. Right. Um, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Richardson, a motion? Yeah, I move that the uh, Preservation Board uphold the director's denial as the windows do not comply with the height marks or by the local historic districts. Second. Discussion now? Nope. <laughs> I have one discussion point to make. Sure. Um, many examples were brought up uh, by the folks who spoke there about uh, the rules not being followed throughout the neighborhood, and I think that's the problem. And, and these, on the north side districts, a lot of times the rules are are not followed as closely as they are in some of the south side districts, and. Uh, but that's no reason we can't f we shouldn't be following the rules that the neighbors put forward in these ordinances We should enforce them even even more stringently. I think so Just I, just I, a thought I'd only know there would, there would likely have been no problem had they applied for a permit Right, right. And I would just add that you know, this is a whole ordinance But we even see this on the south side where some of these ordinances are younger but work was done before the ordinances were passed and that's often cited as justification but Yeah Diligence uh, all around on Africa Okay, commissioners, there's a motion on the floor that's been made and seconded. I'll call a roll. Commissioner Allen, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Hamaker, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commission, sorry. Commissioner Hamilton, do you vote yes or no? Yes. <laughs> Will I call you again? <laughs> when you say her name, I, we always think it's each other. Yeah, it's weird. I'll, I'll, I'll separate. We have to separate. <laughs> yeah. Commissioner Killeen, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Alderman Narayan, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Richardson, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Robinson, do you vote yes or no? Yes. The chair abstains on this vote. I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven yeses and one abstention. The appeal is denied. Thank you, commissioners. Calling agenda item C. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Bob Bettis with staff. I'll tell the truth. I live in beautiful Clifton Heights. Question, right? Either where you live, what neighborhood, and do you love it? That kind of thing. Or? Commissioner Hamilton had asked that question, but I love it. No. Uh, need to enter in uh, an inly ordinance 64689 as amended by 64925. The Benton Park Ordinance, which is 67175. I have PowerPoint, my presentations, and that's it. Uh, this is all one of our fun topics we always <laughs> we get every so often. It's a horizontal wood fence in Benton Park. I think we've reviewed probably I think, 10 of these at some at some point now. So, but the ordinance is still is still there. It is unchanged. So we have to run these through you guys um, for approval. So this is at on Wyoming, uh, just across from Benton Park on the south side of the street context for you. Uh, you may note on the aerial on the right, it's set back a little bit, so the, it has less of a street presence than a lot of the houses on that block. Some quick context for you. Nice speed bump. Uh, okay, so on the map, on the uh, upper left, you'll see the site plan that shows the location of the proposed fence. It's in yellow. It's set towards the rear of the building, and the uh, uh, runs uh, towards the backyard, towards the alley. Um, on the right, you can kind of see back, I'll try my best to show you um, where it will be, if at all, street visible. So it really has no impact on the street whatsoever. It's set so far back. Here is the design of the lovely fence. Um, it gets horizontal, not vertical, as required by the ordinance. The ordinance says that you have to base anything different on a model example, and we don't have that to meet this criteria. So um, given that and our standard um, uh, recommendation for these projects. We still recommend that the board uphold the director denial as the proposed fence does not meet the guidelines of the neighborhood. Um, got a letter late from Benton Park. Benton Park is in support of the applicant's proposal. Wow. 
So they're in support of it? They are in support. Um, if, you, if you saw the, the letter, it came late today. Um, essentially, they are in the process of updating their code, and they're going to include this kind of fence in their code in the future. Hmm. So that's the basis for it. And they feel also this one in particular, it's set so far back. I don't think there's much of a street presence on it. <laughs> if the fence were oriented, if the fence were oriented in the other direction, would you have any problem with it? You mean vertical versus horizontal? Yes. We have no problem with it whatsoever. Good enough. <laughs> Questions for Bob? Okay. Oh, okay. just sorry. When do you think these new standards might be? That is a great question. I have no idea. I know they're still kind of doing their internal vetting and they're kind of working on it as they're, as they're going along. But I don't think anytime soon, unfortunately. But I think they're working on it. All right. But they're drafting. They're drafting it, and then we will keep bringing these things through for you guys to look at. So. Fair. Okay, is the appellant present? Come forward, please. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your time. Tell us uh, your name. My name is Peter Greathouse, also a realtor. Sorry, we're just abundant in here. And yes, that's my real name. Um, I'm noticing a problem. Do you affirm that your testimony is going to be the truth? Yes. Okay. That's the best name for a realtor. It's a great house. Looking for a great house. Wow. Mm. That's remarkable. I mean, you got to lean into it, right? Hold on one second before, yes, before you do your presentation. Commissioners, what do we want to hear? Nothing. <laughs> we, we know. Thank you. Do I hear a motion? I have a motion. What's your motion? Uh, the, the, that the Preservation Board overturn the denial of constructing the horizontal wood fence in Benton Park. So he can construct his horizontal fence. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> <laughs> is there any discussion if the motion is over? Oh, I, may I suggest that we, with, with details and materials to be worked yes, out with staff? Yes, yes, uh, yes. Is that okay with the second? Second, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Discussion, commissioners? We've, we've had, a, a, as you mentioned, a couple of these go through. And, yeah. So. Yeah. Okay, commissioner, I'm going to call a roll. Commissioner Allen, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Hamaker, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Killeen, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Hamilton, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Alderman Narayan, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Richardson, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Robinson, do you vote yes or no? Yes. The chair abstains on this vote. There are seven yeses, one abstention. The appeal is upheld. I get to do it? Here's <laughs> 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 Hamilton. Commissioners calling agenda item D. Again, Bob Bettis with staff. I uh, need to enter in ordinance 69423, which is the Central West End Ordinance, the enabling ordinance, which is 64689, as amended by 64925. My PowerPoint and presentation, and I'm still telling the truth, and I still live in Clifton Heights. All right, so this is the property in question. It's uh, in uh, Fullerton Westminster's Place over on the north side of the block. Give me some context if it will. That's there it goes. There you go. It's kind of south of Olive. Um, see where it's located. Here is some street level context looking west and east. Obviously, um, lovely mansions, you know, left and right, wherever you look, all in great condition for the most part. This is looking north on Newstead towards Olive and then south looking towards the high rises down on Newstead. Um, so for some background, um, back in April, um, we received a phone call from the area building inspectors stating that the roof, the slate roof, um, had been removed and was being replaced um, at that time. Um, so they had an exposed roof. We explained to the, the inspector that it's probably okay for them to continue on to at least secure the building. Um, they had already um, gotten most of the work done, so we didn't want to stop them with a little bit exposed. Um, they, we talked to, I contacted the owner, explained the situation, and they did end up finishing the roof at that time. Okay, 
So I got some pictures for you, some before and after shots. It's kind of washed out, so I apologize, guys. This light bank is really ruining everything. Can you see okay? Thanks for the help. Okay. Yeah. Uh, on the top, you have the uh, current condition, and you have the slate on the bottom. Uh, it was uh, a light gray slate. It had some uh, some severe wear to it. it had some, um, some some greening to it. I'm not sure which was original, the gray or the green, but most likely the gray. Um, there was some severe aging to the slate itself. It's also on the sides of the dormer. Um, there's also some metal ridging, if you notice, on the bottom of the previous condition. That was also removed when they did the replacement for the new um, architectural shingle that was installed. So it's a little bit different. You had more of a consistent color uh, uniformly with the original slate, and the new um, slate has kind of a varied color palette and um, shades of gray. And it's also missing the metal ridging that was installed or was removed. This is the front, this is the side. Again, you can see there's still there's some character change and also a loss of that entire slate roof, which is an important feature to a building like this. And then this is the rear, the same condition where they've removed everything, also including the sides of the dormers, and um, the new um, roof was put on. I spoke with um, the applicant who is here to speak on behalf of the item, um, gave her options uh, in terms of replacing it with slate. At the time, um, she noted that it would be too cost prohibitive to put on a new slate roof. Um, the building is an Airbnb, so it's an income producing property. I think that might play in terms of the budgetary constraints that they, they may discuss this evening. So again, um, staff is recommending denial on this. It's obviously, um, we don't want to lose an entire slate roof like this. It's not a small portion of a roof. This is the entire slate roof was removed. Um, so um, definitely, we, we strongly recommend that the board uphold the director's denial um, uh, as the new slate roof um, does not conform with the standards. The standards say if you have a slate roof, it should go back to the slate roof. And that's pretty much what it says. So you try to repair it if you can, or replace to match. Um, so obviously, the, the asphalt shingle roof does not match what is there. So any questions for me? Have we seen slate roof, slate roof questions in the last couple of months? We sure have. On this block, I think, actually, if I'm not mistaken, there was a, uh, I think Andy brought one. Um, the owners down the block were, um, they were coming to us before doing the work, and it was the, the board upheld the director's denial of that. So we've seen even partial roof replacements where just the front slope was um, being proposed for replacement. So you guys have seen um, this pretty consistently um, in Central West End. And the neighborhood also always backs us up in terms of upholding our denials. We just saw it at the archdiocese, right? Mm -hmm. So the archdiocese, yeah, that, that took months and months and months. That was a clay a tile roof, um, and that took several attempts to find a close uh, matching material. And we finally settled on, you know, something that was similar, not not, not perfect, but they came to you with an alternative eventually. And the so there, there options here? Is it just slate or can they do faux slate? No, I mean, honestly, the code doesn't really allow for even like a Da Vinci type shingle or, or tile itself. It, it says it needs to be original. So, okay. um, so you know, it's, it's, it's an option they can propose, of course, for you, you all to consider for uh, an exception to the code, but um, no, but not at staff level. Thank you. Bob, yes. Insinuation of a claim of financial hardship. Tell me what the cultural resources office has received on that point. Uh, and nothing in terms of actual documentation. The applicant is here, and she can she can detail that further. Um, but I do know again it's an income producing property. I I know they've done an extensive rehab on the property, so I don't want to get into I, that'll be her uh, to, to spell out for you. But we have not received anything in particular about finances. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do we so, have that letter in the record? Um, sure, that, that could be entered in the record. Um, uh, Bill Seibert is here. He, he can, I guess, I mean, he's yeah, gonna, he'll be here to speak on the item. The but we can definitely, how, I, again, I can introduce it. Yeah, I'll introduce in the record the letter from the Central West End, and you have it in your thing. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, Bob. Uh, did you, in your presentation, mention that um, prior to the installation of the you were contacted we were by, sorry. by the owner by the owner no we were not contacted by the owner prior to the installation of this roof no so how did how did that you there was there was contact made prior to the installation by the building inspector by the, the building, building inspector yeah they had already started the project they had removed the slate and sure. were in the process of it reinstalling the installing the new architectural shingle so that's when we heard about the project at that point in time 
from the building inspector. The building inspector, correct. And then I reached out to the applicant, to the owner of the property, to try and you know get the background, explain the situation, and give them their options. Yeah. So I'm I'm trying to get an understanding of at what point of completion, if any, the the roofing project was found out. The inspector called, and it was pretty much it was the slate was all gone at that point the in time. Was yeah, gone. yeah. When, okay. um, but no, but no new roofing. No, had some had already been, some had started to go on. Yes, yeah, some okay. had 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 gone on. So it wasn't out, it was not complete at that time, but um, it a lot had already gone back up. Okay. Yeah, it was, and if I'm not mistaken, that weekend, um, the building inspector is that Chris Green, Andy. Yeah, Chris Green is the area building inspector at that time, and I. Pretty sure there was weather coming in that weekend as well. Mm -hmm. some, some weather coming in, so he's like, they don't button it up, and they finished up the last little bit of it. So. Has he finished asking you questions? I can't. But we do. I, I will. I will know. I do believe. I, Meg yeah. did speak with the uh, Meg. Meg well, for clarification, Meg did speak with the building inspector at the time, who said if they don't finish it up, what will happen? He said it will damage the roof. So we'd be the building. The building, yeah, the building would be damaged if they did not button it up for the weekend. So we discussed with them. Thank you very much. The appellant present? Come forward. Bearing gifts for a moment. I just wanted to give you guys each some kind of very top section of photos, our before photos. And I just also want to go through some of the. Come on for you. Is there one having one, two? I'm not a member. So. No, I know. I just yeah. had nine total. We, so. we will share. Oh, good. Share. Okay. Thank you. And then the back section are going to be parts. So befores are kind of the paper clip. The back is going to be the after photos. Oh, I have enough. I have enough. Thanks. All right. So I'm Lindsay Dousman. And I'm the owner of LV Holdings. Oh, yes. Do you affirm to tell the truth? Yes, I do. Proceed. Okay. I'm Lindsay Dousman. I'm the older of LV Holdings. I've lived in the city now going on um, 10 years since 2013. We live in Tower Grove East. I have three children, 11, 8, and 5. Um, I work as a nurse for Mercy Hospital since 2007. So the property was purchased for 397 Westminster, a beautiful property in 2015. Um, and had been on the market previously by the very first owner for about two years, and then he had taken it off the market. It wasn't until our realtor actually had kind of knocked on his door, knowing that it was once up for sale, to see if he'd be willing to sell it. And we were going to first invest in the property to rehab it. Um, he was eager to sell. He wanted to move out of, the out of town, so we purchased it in 2015. Um, we live in the city. We live in historic district. We love historic districts. We love the homes. We spent uh, over two years rehabbing the home. So I just want to throw out some numbers. Because of economic hardship, I want to really give you a good idea of how much I've spent on this house. So it was purchased 2015 for $492,000. In the beginning of 2016, when we started the work, we hired a general contractor and an architect. They took care of all the permits for us. They took care of all the drawing schematics. We actually knew that there was a tax credit program in the beginning um, that would help alleviate some of that burden. So we spent a half a million dollars rehabbing, $500,000, a little bit over, probably around 520, but rounding down, $500,000 in rehabbing 90% the interior of the home. The exterior had a little bit. We applied for the tax credits, and in the end, we did not get them. So we lost now over $100,000 um, due to tax credits, and we didn't get that back. Once we completed the rehab, we listed it for sale, and it was actually on the market, and you can find all this on Zillow, but it was listed in June of 2018. It stayed on the market until January of 2020. We dropped it all the way down to $725,000, and we couldn't sell the home. And in fact, I couldn't even sell the home for what my current loan is on the home now. I couldn't sell it. We put it back up for sale in May of 2020. 
Then it was taken off and we put it back up again just this past April of 2023. The home sat empty for those two years that it was on the market. I spent $10,000 to stage it, still no buyers. Subsequently, the home itself, due to the mortgage, the property taxes, I was paying $50,000 per year just for it to remain empty. And it was up there for two years. And that was coming out of my personal bank account. So over $100,000 just in that for two years. Honestly, I could not afford to own this home and I couldn't afford to sell it. So I decided to start my own business. I just started an LLC, LV Holdings, and it is now a short-term rental. But I'm not an absent rental, a renter or a, an owner per se, but I go to the home three to five times a week I keep up the neighborhood. I go to the neighborhood association meetings. I went to one two months ago to discuss this and hear their concerns. In late April and early, or in late March and early April, I had a large extensive leak. And actually this photo is kind of perfect. So if you're looking at the photo here, the far kind of right from, from that first window on the right hand side, if you're looking at it, all the way over that wraps around to that first chimney I came into the home after a weekend and it was actively leaking into the master bedroom. That's where the, you can see the master bedroom in one of the photos it was leaking into. A chunk of the plaster had fallen off the ceiling. I went in with my like headlamp, my rock climbing headlamp, crawled through the crawl space. There was tons of buckets set up. It was just leaking everywhere. I actually called my insurance adjuster, had my insurance person come out immediately within 48 hours. Once they got to the roof, they noted that the slate roof had extensive damage, not just to that area, but the roof itself, and that they were unable to point to a specific event or an area of damage, and they weren't gonna give reimbursement. So now I'm out of pocket for the roof as well. I did some research, I found a luxury architectural composite slate shingle made to replicate the authentic appearance of natural slate. I know that I couldn't afford a slate roof Due to the fact that I was quoted by multiple companies upwards of $180,000 for the roof. And if I need a gutter repair, which I had someone come out for that as well, along with the fact that I have copper box gutters, which I love, and I love the history of the old home, but that was quoted for over $100,000 extra. So if I had to do all of that, that was upwards to nearly $300,000. And there's someone on the street now that I know of that is having repairs done that is costing nearly that much. I found a roofer in the same time, looked online in a section on the city that said, determine if you need a permit. And this is where I got my information because I know the question, which Bob had asked as well, why didn't you get a permit? And at the time, I honestly didn't think I need one because I read the section online that said, determine if you need a permit. Roof replacement, I'm just reading this verbatim, roof replacement when done with like material and replacement of 25% or less of the roof sheathing, aluminum, steel, or exterior siding with no change to existing openings. And at the time, upwards of almost 50% of that roof is a flat roof, and I didn't replace any of that. It had already been completely replaced. So I did do, yes, the slope sections. I talked with our roofing company after reviewing the information and also having this material bidding put on in multiple historic districts and even this current one as a fourth of the homes on the street, at least 12, if not up to 14, have a slate shingle. Not this particular one. This is a higher grade, but has a shingle on their roof. We went ahead on the behest of the fact that we had to act quickly to repair the leak to prevent any interior damage occurring because already the plaster on the roof had to, I'm gonna to have to replace most of that. I've already had some of it repaired in the master bedroom, but it was actually falling off. So I found a shingle and I just wanted you to look at some of the photos, you don't have to, but just the before and after photos about the particular product that I used. But it's a special modern update to a shingle. It had layer construction, blended coloration um, that emulates the look of slate. And I know, and you guys know way more than I do about, you know, the longevity of slate. And I know it can last 100 years. But slate is brittle. It can break. Weather attributes to that. It's extremely costly on annual maintenance. 
It's heavy on the existing structures and the beams. But the material that I chose, the best material that I could find, being the fact that I could not afford original slate, is three times lighter, fire resistant, made to look just like slate, and I would argue and attest that it, the roof looks better than it did before. It has special copper infused sealants that keep algae from growing on it. It's more energy efficient. It's engineered to have special high solar reflectance properties and thermal emittance properties that slate does not have. It helps decrease energy costs and it comes with a lifetime transferable warranty. It's over 110 miles per hour wind resistant where slate is only upwards of 60. And I know if it wasn't a good product, then maybe most of the homes, even in a lot of these districts, wouldn't put them on, but they do. Just for this roof alone, it came out of my pocket. I had to borrow money, upwards of $50,000 now, at an 8.5% interest rate. And that's on top of already the $1.1 million that I have into it. And in truthfulness, my business just can't afford the new slate roof. And I cannot afford to tear this one down. My business is underwater. I've single-handedly put over a million dollars into this home just to keep it afloat, to keep it in the best shape, to sell in this historic neighborhood, which honestly, if you're shocked that it hasn't sold, you're not the only one. Because I've been shocked for like four years now that it hasn't sold, and I don't understand. There's abandoned homes on the street, and I don't want this one to be that. I tried to sell this home for what my loan is now, and I could not. Adding on an extra 120, 180, even more for gutters. I don't know what lender would loan me that money, to be honest. I started the Airbnb. I don't want to have it. I never did, to be quite honest. But it helps pay my bills. It pays the bills to keep the house afloat so I can sell it to a single family to live in this neighborhood. So on those expenses alone, I furnished the Airbnb and added 32 more thousand dollars to the house for that. I pay 50 a grand, $50,000 a year in the mortgage, six to eight on insurance. And after all of that, because I'm a small business in a residential neighborhood, I have to pay $30,000 a year in property taxes. Added on to all that. As of now and this year, the revenue that I'm making from this Airbnb doesn't even cover the costs of the mortgage and the property taxes. The rest of it comes out of my pocket. I'm just graciously asking the board to approve this appeal for economic hardship because I don't know how much more money I can put into the home. I wanted the home to be rehabbed, to keep his historical aspects and to be sold to a single family or whoever wants to move in to appreciate this home. And honestly, I do feel punished because I am a short-term rental. I know that the neighbors do not like it and I hear their concerns and I understand their concerns because I don't want it to be a short-term rental either. I want it to sell. In fact, Honestly, I have buyer's commission, and if anyone can send me a buyer, I don't mind giving you that buyer's commission. But I care about the neighbors, and I do care about the city. I don't live out of town. I don't live in Texas or Florida or a long-standing resident. I live here. I work here. I raise my children in the city. I send my children to school here. I own a business here. And in the end, I just don't know what else I can do to help this home out. I can't spend any more money, and I tried to find the best product I could by the information that I found online that also fit in with the neighborhood. The technology is advancing. There's modern advancements in all aspects of roofing, and I just feel that we can use those products and still obtain the historical aspects of the home. That's all. Okay. That might have been long, but... Commissioners? 
Questions for the appellant? Yes. I, I just have one quick question. Um, I, uh, Peter Meredith, uh, State Representative Meredith, uh, contacted me on, on your behalf about this, and he, he did say something that was interesting to me that you didn't uh, bring up here, and so I just wanted to, to dig into it a little bit. Uh, he mentioned that you had tried, that when you were looking at an actual slate replacement, that they were going to be several months out on being able to Yes, at the to, same to time, correct, it. at the same time that I was talking with roofers, because I had to act quickly to have fixed this leak and repair, I was talking with multiple companies who told me that because of recent storms and weather, that I would be at least four to six weeks out. But I knew in the end that I couldn't even still afford upwards of nearly $200,000, let alone wait around at the time if that was the case. I had to act quickly and protect the home. All right, that's the only question I have. Thank you. If, uh, oh, yeah, go ahead. If you, if, so you're, the house is currently listed right now for 1.1. And if I sold it for that, oh, go ahead, sorry. What, could you, will you get a profit? Absolutely not. If I sold the home upwards of 1.25, I still would not get a profit, no. So you're going to owe money? Yes. Well, owe money on my loan, correct? Yes. And With you, all my bills paid up correctly. Is okay. Meaning I would. What's owe, your payoff? I'm not trying to like. No, I no. I mean, I, I really won't make a profit. That's what I'm okay. saying. After I pay. I'm, off, is it not? Because what I'm thinking is, I, I'm not trying to like go down a weird road. That's okay. But I'm thinking, I'm not saying after you've read your rehab costs, like you're. I, I'm not talking about all that. I'm saying after payoff, will you have money left over? After after I pay off the loan, the loan, what which is included, the cost of the home, the rehab. I took a loan out for the rehab, so I have that as well. Okay. Yeah. The, if I sold it for let's say for one point one, no, there would be zero profit. I listed it originally for one point two. If I sell it for one point two, one point two five, there may be ten, fifteen thousand. Okay, that's what I was thinking because yeah. that's like you could Correct. sell it and then Correct. and then have the roof money set in escrow but that's what that's why i was going down that road yes, okay yes. if i could sell it for 1.3 1.4 yeah, then you could put I that could money set yeah. money off correct for a roof and escrow right and i'm not object to that right I, I am not but i physically this business can't afford it if i could sell it for that amount which is estimates which i'm finding out probably they're doesn't not really real. matter anymore yeah, because it real. doesn't <laughs> if i could sell it for that yes okay. i would love to sell it for that put that money in escrow put it up for a roof okay but Okay, that's why I was asking yeah, what you I don't know okay. why I won't say Okay, that. I get it. I get it. Okay. I have a feeling it has to do with the open lots, vacant lots behind it, but yeah. I'm not I'm not 100% certain, so. Alan? All right. Yes. So, I, you gave us a timeline, but I, I also was going through the deeds, and I just, I don't, you know, I'm not trying to ask personal questions. Yeah, but sure. The deed chain shows it. 2015, uh, Jason purchased Correct. The Initially, my husband had purchased the home under his. Let's put another LLC. And it, my LLC. Okay. Yes, correct. Is purchased the, the home. Current LLC. Absolutely. No, no, no. It had lost hundreds of thousands of dollars by then. I created an LLC, took over the deed. I took over all of the expenses. He is not involved at all. I am shouldering this burden. I feel like a lot, you know, but I'm taking over everything. Right now, correct. Okay. Just wanted to figure that out. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Ask away. The second question is, uh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. We have this letter that's real cyber here from the Sun West and Planning and Development uh, the Committee. Have you engaged that committee in any way? So on I topic? sent an email to Mr. D I think it's uh, Dwyer. Dwyer. Is that am I pronouncing it right? Okay, yeah. I, I haven't met him personally, but I sent an email out to him, um, just requesting if we could speak or if he wanted to come to the home. Um, I kind of got a brief email that he was in jury duty, so he couldn't answer a lot, uh, but they would hear us out here at the meeting. And then I had also inquired about the ordinance because I was unaware at the time that the ordinance had stated what Mr. Bettis had said about specifically no architectural shingles. But I was told that the ordinance had changed in 2017, and I'm not sure if they were previously allowed them, but that's what I was informed. And I don't know the ordinance at all so I just sent an email out to Mr. Dwyer but then I had never heard back so were were you aware of uh, 
the special predications from the Central West End or that there would be or did you no, do any due diligence or ask absolutely anybody? Not, no. Okay. No. When I did my research online and mainly when I found from the permit section to see that we were using like material and like material and I, there are slate imitations on the street as well. So a big question I just also have is just is the history of the home wrapped up in the actual composite of the material itself? Because I'm just, I'm just, you know, speaking. Yeah, yeah I'm just dead. No, I know. I, this is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that was my only question when I kind of was digging more deeply into this after I had found out from the preservation board. Um, and then Mr. Green, the inspector, came because we had to have an occupancy inspection at the time. But he said my roof looked nice. So I was. Well, your question about the material. Oh, oh, oh yes. Time. That's what I was going to ask. But yes. I have a question yes, so yes. It seems like you. Well, I knew that we weren't doing any of the sheathing. We weren't replacing any of that. Yeah, I knew that none of the sheathing had been replaced. Yeah, correct. And the inspector saw this written and came for occupancy. Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. He did. Yes. Um, Other questions, Commissioners? Was this our first project? Yeah. So, so I've got a couple of questions for yeah, you. Sure. Um, uh, one, is this your first rehab project, and is it? Yeah, and it might be, it might be my last, um, but uh, yes, yes it is. Yeah. Okay. Second, um, can you actually provide us with documentation on cost? Yes, I can. I didn't bring all that here today only because I knew, to be quite honest, it was a public forum and it is recorded. And I just didn't want to provide all of the public with every single bit of cost. But if the board members themselves would like loan materials, annual expenses, I can have all of that written down for you. Yeah, I guess. I just never our... thought I'd be in a situation where. I mean, it's really sad, like trying to do the right thing to rehab a home because you love the history of it, not realizing you're going to be over a million dollars in debt spending it and then not being able to sell the home which honestly is in one of the most beautiful neighborhoods in all of the central west end so that is our typical protocol correct that we request financial information from applicants no we don't have a protocol and i didn't if I had known to bring those, I, I would have. I, I could have. I was just providing you with big numbers, right? So you I'm could just see. thinking about the last time this came up when I was on the board. It was a woman from Fox Park, and we requested like pay stubs and stuff from her. W nines. W nines. Yeah, I. We, we we do not have a standard. Got it. Um, we have resisted having a standard to give ourselves the greatest amount of flexibility. The, test, the testimony offered by the appellants is affirmed. But if, if we have questions beyond about their word, I mean, we, we have at times asked ask for paper. Yeah, because this is a tough one. Like, I feel like, let's, oh, let's sorry. Let's have a discussion. Okay, okay, sorry. Further questions for the appellant? Um, no, those, those are my if, if I wanted to stay there and I'm, I'm not really a party animal type person, <laughs> what, what are you asking for nightly or weekly that's rental? A, that's a good question. Yeah, actually, I'd love to tell you that. If you have any people you'd love to uh, refer to that wasn't the to point help of my pay, pay the, the light bill of Westminster. Um, so it depends on if it's a holiday, right? Airbnb does set the rates usually, but it usually can go from like 200 and some dollars a night, depending on if it's, let's say a good example, Wash U graduation recently came up and occupancy rate for that is 12, by the way, for that per square foot based off the city's, you know, occupancy. And it can go all the way up to 800 a night per se. Is this for the whole house? The whole house. Yes, um, but it is usually less expensive during the week. But I do want to say this because I know that people are listening on the live stream as well. But 
it's more like person. But. Yeah. <laughs> okay, for the one person who's listening. Thank the you. Person. Yeah, okay. right. So for the one person who's listening, that I can't, I can only tell you how much TLC I put into this, and my words will only go so far. But I only hope that my actions of what I've done can prove that, and even so forth to the Airbnb, or that's not my intent and my hope, but we don't allow parties. They have gotten a bad rap recently around the city. And while we might have 12 people, I went back and looked through our data and the average person, I just wanted to see to give you guys some, you know, some details about it. The average age of someone who's renting is over the age of 45. Upward to 55 is just the average renter. Mostly it's families, people who have children, who are at children's. That's the troublemaking age. Huh? That's the what? Oh, well, yeah. We've had uh, a, a guy who and a wife and who are 60 who got married there. We have families who come there. Um, we don't really allow locals to stay unless it's a personal referral. I have a camera system set up outside. I've spoken personally with GCI security. They know the property is there. I'm doing everything I can, and I want the neighbors to know that as well, to keep them safe so they know who their neighbors are moving in. You don't want to have a new person moving in every night. I speak to each person individually before they book, <coughs> when they come in, what the reason is. And so there are many security measures put in place. And I know I'm just doing the best I can to, to keep it, the bills paid, to keep it as nice as I can for that neighborhood until it's up. Anything else you'd like to introduce for your record? Oh, no, I don't know. No, I think I'm good. Two things. Um, the reason when, the, when this came in, came in, I wanted to reach out to the owners as soon as possible, so I could, you know, try to nip this in the bud as soon as possible. Um, the reason I got a hold of them is because they got permits through our office for the same building in 2015. So they have been through us before. They're, they're, you know, it's not like they were. I understand that your husband was the original contact. However, same, same family, same ownership. They've come through before for permits. So it's not like they were unaware of being in a historic district. So when you have something of this scale being replaced, I think it's not odd for to say, you probably should have called us first. You've done it before. This is something that's pretty straightforward to ask about. And then also about the sheathing question. I'm curious about this because slate roofs are heavy. They are damaging to the sheathing below. I'm curious about even the people on board with the architects, does it seem odd to you to not have to do the sheathing for something like this? Mm -hmm. I mean, especially the damage was such extensive. You said it was, it was bad damage on that one side of the roof. Mm -hmm. We'll necessitate removing the sheathing. I'm only going by what the roofing company had right. told me. I'd but to curious. your permit section, that unfortunately, we didn't apply personally for right. any permits. We'd never contacted the building. While that was our general contractor, we had no communication. And I can fully attest to that, that we did not do anything with those permit process. While our contractors and architects took care of everything, they weren't calling us while they were helping rehab the project to let us know that they were calling the building. And that's just the truth. Okay, are you happy with your record? I'm happy with the record. You happy with your record? I got, so. Um, I'm sorry, a question for whom? For you. Is it a question for Oh, for her, for her. Sure. Um, I'm so I'm having a hard time with this um, because you put that so much money in this property. You just you didn't do any due diligence, like in terms of what's required for maintenance when you're putting all this money into a property and purchasing it. That I just I don't I don't understand. Imagine I, imagine that in a former question. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll picture that. But I guess I don't know when you mean of maintenance. Like upkeep to put a new roof on or if you have to change out the windows, like you didn't do any of that research prior to Well that's what I was saying when I researched about if we're gonna need a permit for a roof. And that was when I found online the roof replacement with like material. I mean I I mean this is the I don't know what else to Yeah, do. no I, yeah. Uh, Bob, you would you would say that's not like material? I would say it's not like material. And that was my only question for the, and, and, I, and I understand, and I hear that concern. And that was my original question afterward was, if, if the actual composite of the slate is what makes the home historic, and I know there have been slate imitation shingles that have been put up, 
which are not natural like original slate is. It's, it is man-made from, and this is man-made as well, made to look identical. And, and it's okay if you don't agree, but if, if the roof looks nice, Secretly raise your hand. No, I'm just going to. Uh, I just have a short <laughs> question just to make sure we're all on the same set of facts, staff and applicant. Yeah. Are, none of the architects and contractors involved in this 2015 renovation period are involved in the 2020? Correct, yes. Period. Correct. These are different people. Correct. Yes, correct. Is my, I just had one other question. Is my person with me allowed to make commentary? <laughs> um, As a person who's here just to support me or not. You're allowed to present your case mm -hmm. and anybody you want to do so. Okay. May I? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Uh, Peter Meredith, State Rep for the 80th District, and I live next door to Ms. Dousman. Uh, I do. Okay. Um, I, I don't normally do this sort of thing at all. Um, I'm a State Rep. I work in Jeff City. I don't really get involved in these things, but uh, I've heard a lot from Ms. Dousman about this property over the course of time. Um, frequently, her kids have been unable to play with my kids because they're going over to help clean and work on the property over there. Um, and I just wanted to be here to, to really vouch for her, uh, her honesty in this process every step of the way, um, but also the fact that she is a, an incredibly diligent uh, neighbor and homeowner um, her house on our block, uh, I believe Commissioner Hamaker grew up on the block. Uh, her, her house is, I would argue, no, I the most well-maintained house on the block, uh, meticulously taken care of by her every day um, because she cares about being a part of the neighborhood. When she bought this house as an investment, it was a dream to rehab a gorgeous historic home. Uh, and she put that same kind of meticulous love and energy into it not because she was looking to make a quick buck rehabbing or flipping a house. This is not a thing she does for a living on a regular basis. She's a nurse most of her life. Uh, and I think that kind of goes to her thinking she was doing her due diligence when there was no longer a general contractor involved in looking at what the permitting process was. But when it comes down to it, in spending time talking to her about this, aside from just the equitable reasons, I, I want you to understand what she's trying to do and how I don't want to punish somebody for investing a great deal of time and money into restoring a home that was falling into disrepair when she bought it. Um, but I think it's really important that we understand why the exception, uh, I'm a policymaker, so I look at policy, why the exception for economic hardship exists. And it's for a situation like this. We're not trying to use the code to bankrupt somebody who's done in good faith everything they can to restore and maintain a home. And uh, when she sought to address a leak, an active leak, and repair a roof, and chose to not take the cheapest option, but actually go with the best material she could afford, that is the same type of material but a higher grade than is already on over a dozen houses on the block, that I can understand why a person who is not a lawyer, who is not an architect or a developer or a professional rehabber would think that that's an allowed material after reading the ordinance. Um, I, I can't imagine bankrupting her business when it's already barely staying afloat, arguably underwater, as she's trying to sell this property and do something good for the city. Um, so I, as somebody that represents a historic district, uh, my, much of my district that I was elected to represent is historic. I grew up in the Shaw neighborhood, a historic neighborhood. I was president of the Neighborhood Association, and I tell you, it is rare. I'm not sure I've ever stood up against a Neighborhood Association's opinion. I get the importance of the neighborhood process. I get the value of historic preservation. It is really important to me, too. But I also understand that the exception for economic hardship is there for a reason, and I just want to vouch for believing that this is very much a circumstance that warrants it. So happy to take questions if anyone had any, but. Remember when you and Commissioner Gilbert would walk up to the park and fish together? <laughs> we, we didn't actually do that. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't really grow up together. I grew up on, in Shaw, not on this block that I'm on now. But I did take my girls over there fishing for uh, um, crawdads two weeks ago. That was fun. Okay, let's hear from Mr. Siebert.
Give your five. It's probably Dwyer wanting to know if you've testified yet. What's that? It's probably Dwyer wanting to know if you've testified yet. Yeah, right. I am filling in for our chairman of our committee who uh, sent the letter to you. My name is William Seibert. I live at 54 Waterman Place in the city of St. Louis. And I will tell the truth. Proceed. Okay. I'm just reading this letter from our neighborhood planning and development committee into the record. Chairman Callow and members of the board, the matter before you is yet another <clears throat> regrettable and avoidable example of the owner of a property in a historic district undertaking an exterior renovation project, in this instance, a roof replacement, without first obtaining the required permit for the work and then seeking relief from the applicable design standards based on what when this letter was written, an unsubstantiated claim of financial hardship. We've heard a lot about financial hardship this, this morning or this afternoon. The stated objective of the Central West End Historic District Standards is, quote, to maintain the distinctive character, quality of construction, and individual architectural integrity of structures within the historic district. Specifically, the standards state clearly that repair is preferable to replacement unless evidence is presented confirming that conditions are sufficiently deteriorated that repair is determined to be impractical, in which case original or historic roof materials shall be used wherever the roof is visible from the street. Please refer to the attached exhibit in which relevant excerpts from the standards are presented. Are presented. There's perhaps no better example than Fullerton's Westminster Place of where uniform adherence to that objective has yielded noteworthy results. The 50 plus structures on those two blocks represent a shining example of the value of historic preservation, in large part attributable to the commitment of most property owners to voluntary compliance with the standards. In some cases, intervention of the Cultural Resources Office and the Preservation Board has been required to compel compliance. As noted previously, it is essential to maintaining the integrity of the Central West End Historic District standards that they be applied uniformly and consistently. It is worth recalling that slate roofs on at least 10 structures located in Fullerton's Westminster Place have either been restored, and I give the addresses here, I won't send the letter, or replaced with new slate in recent years, thereby maintaining the exceptional architectural quality of those two blocks. Recently, in October 2022, the Preservation Board denied a similar appeal, um, a de denied a similar appeal to that before you today, and required the slate be re that slate be used to replace the visible portions of a roof at 4349 Westminster Place. For the reasons stated above, the Central West End Planning and Development Committee recommends that the determination of the Cultural Resources Office be upheld and that this appeal be denied. Thank you for your consideration, James Dwyer Chair. I would just say, of my own bat, that maintaining original materials, especially when they're character defining, is an important part of historic preservation. In this case, a slate roof such as had been on 4397. Westminster qualifies most definitely as a character defining element of the house. Um, it was referred to a number of houses on the block that have architectural shingles of various quality. I would submit that most, if not all of those, were applied before these standards were in place. So again, you have, I think it's irrelevant to point to that unless you can say they were put on in compliance with the existing standards. Um, any questions? I will try to answer. Nope. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Commissioners, that concludes testimony in this matter. M Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, I, I, have, um, I have one more question for the appellate. So, 
How how long have you? How long has this been um, a short term rental? Just a little over two years. Okay, and in that two year period, um, tell me what it's brought in. So let's see. Last year, off the top of my head, it brought in around like one thirty, one hundred forty thousand. Um, this year it's 80, but it costs about 100 to pay the bills to own the home. Mortgage, again, um, commercial property tax of $30,000, it costs around $115,000 just to own the home annually, if not more. Um, you were asking earlier about budgeting, but I spend on lawn care. I mean, just off the top of my head without having a, you know, numbers in front of me. Uh, those, those are small items I don't, I don't but yeah that. and and then again uh but that also sorry it brought that revenue in but that initial year I had to pay off the 30,000 that I put in to for the um the furniture to furnish it and this year it's at 80 and again it's around 110 a year just to to run the place so gotcha. um and then two more things yeah uh, just just to clarify. Wait, to date, is that 80? Hmm? To date, is that 80? Yes, but actually throughout the whole year, you're able to book throughout the whole year. So we have several bookings all the way even through December, even into next year. Um, but yes, correct, to date. To date. Yes, to date. Um, and then purchase price, rehab price. So purchase price is 492000 And then... Um, rehab price just for the rehab itself. I said 500,000. It's a little bit over that, but I'm rounding down, but it's a little bit more than that. 500,000. Um, it sat empty for those two years, so I put in about 100 to 110,000 dollars out of my own pocket for that. Uh, borrowed 48. I'm sorry, what was the, what was the 100,000 for? When the home was empty, just paying the bills on it was 150, the... yeah, over 50,000 per year because insurance. You know, property taxes onto that. Okay. Um, that's that's okay. all I well, need. Thank you. Now you lost me. So, <laughs> how much does it cost you a year with debt service and all your mortgages, property insurance, lawn care? All that yeah, it's over a hundred thousand dollars. But I can't give you a finite. I'm just sort of generalizing for you without all the numbers in front of me. But then in 2022, you took in one hundred forty thousand. Correct. But I had to pay off that initial, that was the initial year when we had opened, but I had to pay off the initial furniture that I furnished it with. So that would cancel out all of that. We were still in the negative for that year. It was 32000 for that. Yeah, and then around the 110000 to own it. Okay. Hundred or 110? I'll round down to say a hundred, but I know it's over that. Okay. But let's just simplify it and say that. Right now we have quite the major holidays, which are the ones that are usually booked. So there's Thanksgiving, Halloween actually is booked, and Christmas. But right now it's at 80, and if I had to just guess, I don't know if there's any more current bookings. It, hopefully, I'm hoping it'll be close to 100 to pay off that, yes. So Correct. Why was last year done? I have no idea. It, so... I, I, it, it just varies year to year on what it is. I don't have a projection because I don't know. I can only tell you what the bills are and what I made. I mean, this is my first time of doing Airbnb. I don't, I don't know how it's projected. I don't know other than the fact that it's, I just go with what Airbnb does. I just, they just give me a price to set. And then at the end of the year, they give me. But you, with Airbnb, you can raise the price. Like they Correct. give a suggested price, but Correct. I know people that raise it to 100 and, and they can get and that. And I, I can show you that I don't do that. Yeah. yeah. But you can. I let them use their algorithm. It's actually an algorithm. Every night you're booked, they actually increase your rate or something by like $10 a, a night or something. I don't know. So my final question. Yes. Uh, um, if all right, so eighty at this point, and correct, you, and you currently have bookings throughout the year, and what's correct based on those bookings, 
all those bookings combined equal, it's actually around $81,000. So another 81 over the 80 that you currently have. No, no. It, all the bookings combined. So you can book out a year in advance. So up until right now, all the way up through the end of December, everybody that's already booked, the total amount is $81,000. Now, okay. if someone else books in between those, which mainly are the weekends that get booked up, most people do not book during the week. I find they come in for things during the weekends. But if people book, I can add on to that, correct? No, no, no. I, I just was... don't know what that will be because I can't guarantee that that will happen. I, I understand yeah. that. I was trying to get clarity on is 80000 what what has actually come in? No, it's just the total expected right now as of to date for this year. Okay. Yes, that's correct, sorry. Further questions? We're clearly a, a little confused with, with all of your numbers. Okay. Um, Do you have an operating pro forma? Meaning? <clears throat> what does that mean? Do you have any of your business documents that would state costs and income on a spreadsheet? Not with me. I can get you those, but I didn't know to bring all of that. Commissioners, do you have to I, this I, or, you, or are you happy? I can just with give you sort of no. I can give I'm you all happy. the little numbers. I just can't give you like utilities, right? Maintenance costs. I, I, yeah, I don't know. I could. I'd, I'd like to see. I don't know if this is too intrusive, but we've asked for W, whatever. Uh, I'd like to see payoffs also. Um. Because for purposes of the escrow. Do we, Meg, do we have any running clock on this? No, you can defer, sorry. No, no. I guess I just don't know what, yeah, you can let me. Defer the item if you'd like. So. I have a question for staff. Is it too late for that moment? No. Okay. Is there anything that could be done to the roof to add back any details? So like for example, I don't know enough about roofs, but these things that are, that run down the corner Sure, I can rich. tell that up there and the one they put in, those are pieced together with shingles, and then the original, it looks like a solid piece of, I don't know, copper maybe? With metal. Not metal. I mean, that, yeah, I mean, they could do that. I mean, it might compromise what they've installed, but I mean, that's an element that could be added back on, um, but it's, you know, oh. it's, that's, of course, a weird. possibility. Okay, never mind. Forget it. They tell me it'll look weird. It'll look weird. It'll look, it'll look uh, yeah, it's, I mean, that's, I mean, it could, you could, but then, I think it's a good idea. Can I say something for the record really quick, and just so you're aware? Yeah. In the past, when the board has, has asked, requested um, information financially, it mm -hmm. does come into us. We don't broadcast it out. Yeah. It is given it oh, to them I understand that, just, yes. I, I just didn't know I was supposed to bring it here, like, this evening to present to everyone. That was all. Well, it's no supposed to, but right. you're, you're, you are both made a strong assertion of financial hardship, mm -hmm. but have thoroughly confused us with the numbers that you've presented. And to, to respect your assertion, yes, we'd probably like to see your numbers, but I'm going to talk to the board for a second. Okay. And see if that's what <laughs> we want. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um. By the way, um, once you do give those documents yes. to the Cultural Resources Office, they are open records. We're not going to broadcast them on this broadcast, but they're not protected, just to let you know. Someone could pull up. Meaning? Someone could pull up. If someone requested the information, then they would receive it. They're in the public record, so you can't share it with just us. Your social security number would not be public. Your account numbers would not be public, but the numbers themselves could be public if somebody asked Meg for them. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I'm not really sure what to do about that, but I don't know if that's... I mean, you know, I just, I mean... Are we, so... Yeah, I mean, I don't 
personally care to be forthright, right? I mean, that is what I'm doing. I don't mind. Ever, you, I just don't know if the whole public needs to know. I mean, I don't know who's going to request them, though, I guess. But I doesn't really. We can, I, make, we can make a motion now and vote on yeah, the top or down, or we can give you a month with that information, which clearly some of us, I think, mean, it might change the outcome. Yeah. That's true. I mean, I would be, yes, I would be okay with that. Mr. Richardson, do I hear a motion? Yes, I move that uh, we uh, defer this item until our next meeting to give the applicant time to present financial hardship information, uh, the information that would show if she can make a reasonable return to the income producing property on her investment. Second. Discussion, mm -hmm. Commissioner? So, yeah, so I, I, I will start because of have, having done construction and architecture um, and built in the Central West End, I'm a block over and a block down from this house. Um, I, I haven't seen his house, but it's probably square. <laughs> It's probably what? <laughs> Square? Okay. He only builds in squares. Okay, <laughs> all right. It is sort of a square, I guess. Yeah, I'm not really for a fair um, the, the reality is we, we can clearly see what she purchased the house for, and, and I was able to get on to Geo St. Louis and, and see the, the pricing based on permits, and I know that those are always – Low. and I said that on the record um, uh, and so I, I you know there's there is no question just based on those two things that she's underwater on this because it's just not going to sell where where it needs to I, I mean, the, for me because because her numbers I, there are certain numbers that I, I know, uh, but there are others that, that I was just not sure about that I think really speaks in favor of you, but need to see that. Other yeah. discussion? No, I, I, this is a hard one because I am under the firm belief that even if it's your first project, you really got to do the due diligence and research. I feel like everyone will watch this HGTV and just gets into this business. But um, also, I won't be able to sleep at night if I'm bankrupting you. So um, <laughs> I guess if, yeah, if, if you can pr produce the information that was requested, maybe that will be uh, very helpful. But I, I just, I, 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 we looked up the property and I think, I mean, it's just overpriced for the area, so you're probably gonna it's probably gonna sell for a lot less than what it's listed for, yeah. which is concerning. Um, yeah. But I don't know if I want to like make a life altering change for you based upon a mistake of of thinking like material. So I don't know. That's yeah, I mean, I I think a number of those things come into question for me, but 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 really more importantly. Even if she had brought this, even if she had gotten a permit and paid for these shingles, she would have, I, I mean, she's still going to be underwater on this. And that's the problem. This, we're, we're basing this off of what, of what we know right now and what I can look up on Geo St. Louis, what she was able to look up on, on the purchase price of the home. And so you add the, you add slate shingles on top of this cost, she's already underwater. So yeah. there's just no, I mean, I mean, so I understand. Was, was, was but she, you don't, I don't. Water from the, the yeah. She, her tax credits got turned down? Yeah. Yeah. So, but I, I just feel like I understand the underwater part, and that's what's bothering me. But at the same time, I, I think when you go into a project and purchase this type of thing, you run your numbers, and it's, it looks like the numbers weren't, run properly if this she if this uh roof was at the you know five years ago you would have known this roof was needed to be replaced pretty soon so in my opinion you did with the research to figure out oh i need to figure out this cost or call cultural uh, resources or call who i need to call to figure out why has this been sitting for two years i guess that's just my train of thought um 
So I guess when you're making such an investment, putting a million dollars into it and then saying at the end, I, I'm out of money and now the, at the expense of the neighborhood and its integrity, that's where I'm having this, this tug and pull. If, if the motion to defer fails, I'll introduce a motion to deny the appeal. Okay. So our first vote will be on whether or not to defer this till the next meeting to give her a chance to put that her means. numbers into the right column. If that motion fails, I'll ask for another motion, and the motion I will ask for is to consider the appeal itself. Can you ask for the payoffs also? The payoff, the loan payoff. Okay, before we vote, we, before we vote on this, would everybody say what they'd like to see at the next meeting? Um, yeah, so I'll start with, uh, I, I want to see uh, the, the price of purchase of the home, uh, the, all of the construction cost information, and uh, the, um, so in addition to that, I want to see what the home produces an income, um, and then all of the other miscellaneous things, taxes, um, insurance, mortgage, all of that. I want to see what the home produces, and I, I think the clear answer, in my opinion, I don't, I don't care about side costs or furniture costs. I just call, care about what the end result, the payoffs because you can take that money, put it in escrow, and that, that can cover the roof when, it, when it's taken care of. So I wanna see the actual payoffs, because if extra money was, that's, that's the loss that she's gonna to have to take. Yeah. So that's my main concern, because I think that'll tell us everything. Excellent point. Yeah. Can I ask just a question about payoffs? I just yes. wanna, what that Paul, really means. Paul, whoever you're paying your monthly mortgage to or your monthly um, you construction you know loan to, okay. and ask them for the final payoff for those loans and, and, and have them fax it or email well, it to you. What the final numbers what will the be. Final, oh, I got you. Right, okay. Okay. For, and then I send it you. over, and then that'll give us. Okay. Um, yeah. I know I have that. Yeah, I have all that. I know the bank. Okay, okay. okay. I was just confused. but. Um, I because guess I, I think it's because I guess I'm concerned that when it didn't even sell for 725, and yeah. that's my big concern. I'm actually like very frightened, honestly, that this home, of what all I owe now, and that's fine, and, and it is what it is. But that even at like 750, I can't sell it. I mean, so realty, what I would do I mean, is uh, I, I, what really, I would do is talk to whoever your realtor is and tell them to to be honest and give you the real comps. I would come prepared with comps next time because every realtor honestly that i talk to right now and i just kind of drives me a little bit insane is like oh this kid well, let's up it to 1.5 okay million. well they're this doing they're big, doing you a disservice this is call your deal. call whoever you trust tell them to run the comps i would bring it to the next meeting so we it would might it could potentially okay, help you bring the comps okay that's and good so we can see what this house is actually worth because 1.1 1. 1 is way too much in my opinion see so and that's what's wild is like it's estimates for one estimates point, not 1.2 yeah. right and that's what yeah, that's what I would what do. What do you want to say? Nothing else. Um, cookies would be nice over there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's not, that's I'll bring cookies because I didn't know we were having coffee. Oh, no, so that's I'll, not uh... asking you. And I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm like, just joking. Thank you for putting the vegetables out there. That was nice. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I would say uh, I'm curious uh, why you got turned down for tax credits. Maybe you can just answer that question, but you could bring evidence of that too. Yeah, oh, I can answer that question actually. So remember we talked about when it was first purchased under an LLC, right? We talked about that. You asked that question. And when it was purchased under an LLC, my husband owned that LLC. We applied for the tax credits. We hired that general contractor, our architect. Um, anyway, Steve Burns was our architect, but anyway. We did all the paperwork. When it went to the state, at the time, we had actually deeded the property just back over to my husband's name, which was going to be on the tax. He owned the LLC, but he just wanted to make sure his name was up front instead of the LLC. So they actually declined it. They said on a technicality, all the information was perfect, but the technicality was that even though he was an owner of an LLC, since the name didn't match 100%. So we actually hired a lawyer at that time, uh, Anders Consulting, locally in St. Louis. 
and they went and they actually spoke and I don't know all these quite details but I think that the Missouri State Tax Credit Program has their own law team on there so our lawyer spoke with them and they actually were kind of rooting for us to get the tax credits and so long story short he just said look We've all spoken. We've done some delegating. You can spend a bunch of money with me, and I can fight a little bit harder, but the bottom line is is they're going to deny you on that. So, Alderman? Uh, yeah, uh, based on your uh, testimony here today and Representative Meredith's testimony, I don't know why I'm feeding back here. For sure. Um, I, I, if it was up to me, I would vote to overturn the... the um, the recommendation and, and get you out of the economic hardship you're in um, but yes <laughs> um, but uh, I, I understand that uh, some of my colleagues want to hear uh, want more information and my, my hope is that you can provide that uh, for them and, and maybe sway sway them on that thank you David, anything you want to say? Uh, if you've done your tax return from last year that'd be helpful just one okay Okay. Okay, commissioners, there's a motion on the floor that's been made and seconded. The motion is to defer consideration of this until the next meeting. I'm going to call the roll. Commissioner Allen, do you vote yes or no? Yes. 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 One abstention. The motion was to defer consideration of this until next week. You have some idea of what we'd like to see. We will leave this appeal open. You'll still be under oath when you come back. Thank you. I'll bring cookies next time. I I no, prepared. we don't need them. Oh, we don't for need them. That was a bad joke. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> very quick break. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I just want to point out anyone who's parked in the garage, any of the board members who parked oh, in the wait, garage. Oh, wait, do you guys want to keep all those photos? Or do you no. Just no. Like, you can ask. Uh, uh, I'll just take it back if you want. I'll yeah. just put them in my folder. Did you introduce them? I grew up at the corner. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. It's a great street. I heard him say that. I didn't know that. More neighbors. So, is that for the record? I, I live in the 4200 block of the line or something. Oh, neighbors from this. Got it. Got it. Yeah, one okay. I live on the street that her dad is I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry I took up so much time. Yeah, I don't hold that. So, okay. Okay. Central West End is nice. But
Thank you for the fresh vegetables. <laughs> Barb, I have a new show for you. It's called Plain with Me. Oh my god. I'm already watching so many 90 day spinoffs. I'm like, all these couples in my head. Yeah. I know. And I always say I'm not going to like start Yeah. Yeah. You know what I haven't seen? Is that documentary on Netflix, The Shiny Happy People? My sister told me. She said it's so insane. I kind of like to see it. She said it's about my younger. She said it is so much. Yeah, I heard it is. I haven't finished episode one. Yeah. You know, did you ever see the, I heard this on a podcast, and this was against the guy that directed the Babylon Bee. Oh, have you heard it's, a, it's a political like, satire yeah. thing. The right wing version of the audience. Yes. <laughs> and he, what I heard him interviewed on the podcast because his parents were in that, whatever, if you want to call it, like a cult. Yeah. And he said he actually, I mean, it, like, his story was. It was they said it went He said when they. Yeah. He said, like, a baby. And they, um, the parents have to be in control of the yeah. children. And if a baby, like, wants a toy, yeah, they, they knock it out yeah. of their hands. That's all so, the because it yeah. only comes from yeah. the, the parent. Oh, right. Anything only comes that's, that's from the desk. That's from the desk. And, and the, guy, the guy who um, that would be said he went to a school, like a college, he couldn't like, talk to women or anything. Oh, and, and you can see he's uh, very irreverent uh, person. Yeah, yeah. And he said he joined the military because he knew his parents couldn't subvert his plan. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs>
that's the other thing. started working for the city that people would be amazed at how much activity is consistently going on. Yeah. Which is a good thing. <laughs> Morning. Firefighter party forever? <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay, we ready? Technology ready? Okay, welcome back. Agenda item E is a series, say E, F, and second. E, F, and G are things in Forest Park. If it's okay with commissioners, we have Forest Park here. They've got a quick presentation. We'd like to hear it. I'll entertain a motion when they're finished. Great. Proceed. Great. Uh, my name is Ted Spade. I'm one of the uh, founding partners of SWT Design. We're a landscape architecture uh, planning firm here in St. Louis. And I'm also uh, a very long time St. Louis resident with uh, a lot of history here. So I always uh, love coming before the board here and talking about great things that are happening in our city, including Forest Park. Um, I'm also joined here by Russ Vollmer. He is with Forest Park Forever. So if we need to backfill anything that's going on with uh, Forest Park Forever, he'll be able to help on that as well. Uh, this has gone through a very lengthy process with a nine-step process in Forest Park. As many of you know, uh, it goes through a lot of advisory boards and reviews. Um, just to give you a little bit more familiarity, this is the very eastern uh, edge of the park. This is part of the uh, linear waterway system that is incomplete currently, and this project will actually complete the linear waterway uh, all the way to Jefferson Lake and from the Grand Basin itself. Uh, just a little point of clarification <clears throat> that's interesting. Uh, I can remember in the 60s, 
fishing in Jefferson Lake, so that's how long I go back. And I found out later on that this is one of the, this is the oldest urban fishery in the country uh, with the Department of Conservation. So it's very much a beloved asset. It's part of the park, the eastern side, that hasn't had a lot of attention as of late, so it's exciting to be able to finally complete this portion of the master plan. Uh, you'll see in your uh, report there, it's made up of, of three chunks, the uh, Round Lake area, Jefferson Lake and Bow Lake, and the area that we refer to as the Oxbow, which is in front of the Steinberg Skating Rink. Um, this picture here just illustrates what it looks like today. It's uh, basically a disconnected waterway system. Um, it's uh, hard to get to some of these areas, and it's uh, one of the very few portions of the park that has not been uh, restored or given attention to. Uh, the master plan, or the actual uh, final plan uh, to date, uh, envisions uh, restoring Bow Lake itself. It silted in quite a bit. Uh, some of you may know Seven Pools that was built during the CCC period. Uh, that is being restored to its uh, original uh, look um, and improve uh, that and the bridge itself. There's a limestone bridge there that was in uh, very poor condition and that has been restored as well. Uh, Jefferson Lake itself, uh, again, has had a lot of shore erosion. Uh, uh, it's hard to get to. Uh, we want to improve fishing access to the edges besides the, uh, the dock that's out there now. And then the Oxbow area is the piece that has not been completed as of yet either. Um, so I'm, I'm going to run through these pretty quickly. Again, I just mentioned uh, Bow Lake itself uh, so is... It is... Yep. Grand Lake? It's not Grand Lake. Uh, so that is Round Lake. That's, uh, I think, an air. Well, and there's, so Round Lake. Uh, that's Round Lake? Old Lake? I would have explained that if I had been. And, and Jefferson Lake? And Jefferson Lake, yes. Okay. Yeah. Commissioners, do you have questions for Forest Park on any of these projects? <laughs> yes. No. Uh, Commissioner Allen, have you got a motion? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I move that the Preservation Board recommend to the Board of Public Service the approval of the permit for the work performed at Grand Lake and Forest Park. Public space pursuant to Ordinance 64689, Section 51 is codified in 2424010, the revised code of the City of St. Louis. You actually meant Bull Lake and Round Lake and one other lake. Yes. Jefferson Lake. Jefferson Lake. Second. So second. Second. All three. <laughs> Is there any discussion? Yeah. Hearing none. Commissioners, I'm going to call a roll. <laughs> Just for all three. Yes. Unless you want us to separate. No. Nope, nope. Okay. There's a motion on the floor that's been made and seconded after extensive discussion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Commissioner Allen, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Robinson, do you vote yes or no? He's not back yet. Ah. <laughs> Commissioner Hamaker, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Killeen, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Richardson, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Hamilton, do you vote yes, yes or no? <laughs> the chair abstains on this. There are five yeses, one abstention, one absence, and one recusal. The motion carries. Congratulations. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> and Jan, that is why. So do you want me to skip the next two as well? No. <laughs> <laughs> Calling agenda item H. I think he's a light on the details though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just give me a second. Don't you want to look at the uh, cascade? Isn't this beautiful? It is. That is That's pretty. pretty. That's the bridge. Okay, um, the three that you saw previously were actually referrals from, not real referrals from the uh, Board of Public Service. They were, in fact, building permits, and that's why we divided them up. These two are, in fact, formal referrals under the city's new City Works uh, database. So. Um, this is a very simple one. This is a, a extension to the sidewalk to allow the construction of a, a stair and a handicapped ramp. 
to, and the reopening of that door. Now, we have no purview over what's the rehab of the building itself. We're only looking at the encroachment into the public right of way. So the staff is recommending that the board advise the Board of Public Service to uh, approve the project. Questions for Jan? Yeah, my other question is, you have this under 242410, but this is a 020. I'm sorry? So under the new stuff that we're doing, isn't this a 20, section 2424.020, which is exterior design review of structures or pictures dated by the city or rented by our extended over public streets, parks, etc.? Yes, you are correct. Is your recommendation still the same? It is the same. We <laughs> got a motion. Move the preservation board recommends the board of public service the approval of the permit for sidewalk widening and construction of ramps and steps pursuant to the 64689 codified at 2424.020. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, I'll call the roll. Commissioner Allen, do you vote yes or no? Uh, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did you vote yes, yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Hamaker, do, do you vote yes or no? You. <laughs> yes. <laughs> who, did, who did I just call? I, well, we've all said yes. <laughs> <laughs> they, hand, they answer to each other's names. Commissioner Cohen, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Uh, Alderman Ryan, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Richardson, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Robinson, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Clarify for the record, Hamaker and Hamilton both both voted yes? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like twins. There are seven yeses. The chair abstains on this, and the motion carries. Thank you, commissioners. Let's do agenda item I. Okay. This one is a little bit more substantial. This is the um, conversion of this block of North 9th Street to be incorporated within the east and west uh, sections of City Garden. This is looking at it towards the uh, south. This is its current state. It's been blocked for several years. Mm -hmm. um, but this is the proposal. It's a series of planting areas, decorative paving. The one interesting uh, thing that you can see in the, in the plan to the right is that the serpentine wall currently in, that exists in both gardens will be connected in this garden. So, just a couple more shots of its current condition, and then some uh, shots of the existing gardens. That's a section of serpentine wall on the right, which is going to be connected, um, and various planting areas, which will be similar to the rest of the garden. Any questions? So, will the sawhorses remain, or? Well, I'm sorry. <coughs> the the is currently blocked at both ends with temporary barriers. Oh, the saw, saw bucks no, they're, I'm sure that they'll go. <laughs> Who's paying for it? The Gateway Foundation? Yeah. Further questions, commissioners? The designer is the same firm that did the original? I believe so. Oh, Commissioner Hamaker, have you got a motion? Uh, yes. I move that the Preservation Board recommend to the Board of Public Service the approval of the permit for a new garden area in this public space pursuant to Ordinance 64689, Section 51, as codified, I assume, in 242420. Yeah. Is it correct that it needs to be the 20 in this one as well? Yes, sir. Thank Great. <laughs> Second. Discussion? Hearing none, I'll call a roll. Commissioner Robinson, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Richardson, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Alderman Narayan, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Colleen, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Hamilton, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Hamaker, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Allen, do you vote yes or no? Yes. The chair abstains on this. Count seven yeses, one abstention. The motion carries. Thank you. Commissioners. Could I have a motion to enter into closed section pursuant to 601.0211 of the revised statutes for the purpose of confidential or privileged communications between a governmental body and its attorneys? Yes. Second. Do I need a vote to go into closed? I'll vote to go into closed, yes. Okay. Do I, does it need to be a roll call? Yes. Yep. 
Following the roll, Commissioner Allen, do you vote yes or no? Yes. yes. Commissioner Hamaker, do you vote yes or no? Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. <laughs> Commissioner Hamilton, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Did you vote twice? Nope. <laughs> Commissioner Killeen? Yes. Alderman Narayan? Yes. Commissioner Richardson? Yes. Commissioner Robinson? Yes. Chair votes yes. There are eight yeses. We are in closed session. Who second the motion? Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Meg Lusto with the Cultural Resources Office, here to present the remanded item at 3243 Indiana. Um, this is an item that was heard originally in 2019, um, and I will go through the timeline as to why it's back in front of you. Uh, but basically, this was a, a request to the staff to demolish the house at 3243 Indiana. The staff denied that. Um, this came to you on July 29th of 2019. You heard the appeal of the, our denial for the demolition of this property. You upheld that denial. The owner subsequently asked the Planning Commission to review the Preservation Board's decision, and the Planning Commission in October declined to take up the matter for review. The owner then appealed to the Circuit Court for the City of St. Louis, and on March 22nd, the Circuit Court upheld your decision. The owner then appealed to the Circuit Court's decision to the Missouri Court of Appeals Eastern District, and that is the body that has remanded this matter to the Preservation Board um, to make specific findings of fact and conclusions of law regarding the eight criteria enumerated in St. Louis City Ordinance 64832, Section 5, on which you based your decision to deny the applicant or the appellant a demolition permit in sufficient detail to allow ju judicial review in accordance with the Court of Appeals December 20th, 2022 opinion. So you are directed to review the record, which includes the 2019, sorry, July 2019 Preservation Board agenda, the minutes and PowerPoint, which I will show you in a moment, and we are also going to watch the video from 2019, and then to make specific findings of fact and conclusions of law based on the eight criteria in Ordinance 64832. And I will note that your task here is limited. With law, you can only take into consideration the existing record. No new or additional evidence or testimony is permitted. So what I'm going to do now is just show you the PowerPoint that was presented in July of 2019. This is the exterior of the building. This is the building's location. I'm sorry, for those of you who weren't able to turn around. Again, this is the picture from 2019, front of the building. This is its location, obviously right across from Carnegie Place. Um, this is the facade that was the um, I guess inspiration for the demolition request. The rear facade and the north facade. Looking south on Indiana, so in context, showing the park across the street. North along Indiana. And a map of the um, Benton Park National Register District showing the location here circled um, as a contributing structure. That's in greater detail. Okay. And we will now watch the video. Starring Dan Grasmo. Resources for the city of St. Louis, and I swear to tell the truth. Uh, so we're here. Uh, my name is Dan Krasnoff. I'm the director of cultural resources for the city of St. Louis, and I swear to tell the truth. Uh, so we're here to hear a re appeal of the denial of um, uh, 3243 Indiana Avenue. I'd like to enter the following items into the record. Ordinance 64689. Ordinance 64832. Uh, ordinance um, 64925, which is there. Uh, ordinance 67175, which is the Benton Park Local Historic District Ordinance. I'd like to enter into the record the application um, for the approval of the 
the application seeking the um, the demolition, and also into the record the uh, denial of that uh, demolition, which is inside the demolition application paperwork. I'd like to enter into the record the PowerPoint presentation you're all about to hear. Into the record an appeal of the denial by Jim Gaw. A letter of opposition to the demolition by the Benton Park Neighborhood Association. And finally, a um, copy of the southern portion of the National Register District map with a circle of the building in question, and then a local or a, a blow up section of the part right, the blocks where the demolition is proposed with the building identified in a circle. So with that, um, I will state that the preservation, the rec staff recommendation is the preservation board uphold the director's denial of the demolition because the building is a contributing resource to the Benton Park Local Historic District and National Register Historic District. At that point, I will show the slides. So this is our building uh, at 3243 Indiana Avenue. Um, there's a lot of trees in front of this building. It makes it hard to get a really good um, straightforward picture of it, but this is the best I could get. This is a site plan showing the building on the block. So um, this is near a couple of different parks. So Benton Park is just at the end of the block across the uh, street at the end of the block up here. And then you have Carnegie Place Park, which is a two block long park space that you'll see in the pictures in a moment. And then you have the buildings the block in question here, the owner lives the building just to the south of 3243 and uh, the applicant. And then, of course, you have 3243 itself, which is uh, uh, surrounded by the dashed lines. On the left is the front um, the east facade of the building. It should not say wall down there. I don't know why that says that. Is that me? On the, on the right is a picture of the south facade of the building. And as you can see, I don't even need the pointer for that, um, there is a part of the building missing. And uh, that uh, happened uh, when there was con demolition going on, both at the alley and of a, which, for which there was a demolition permit granted, and of a small, um, not historic gazebo that used to be next to the building here. That was being demolished as well. There was no permit for that. And um, the, the, uh, the, the way the definitions read in the ordinances we're working from is that any, the demolition of any structure in the district requires a permit. So the gazebo being a structure, really, there should have been a demolition permit for that as well. And there you see the best picture I could get of the north facade, which is intact, and a bad picture of the back of the building, but I will testify that that is uh, intact as well. Um, just to go back to the slide on the right here, the, um, the collapse of that according to the owner, and they're here to testify for themselves, but I was told by them that, um, uh, that vibra vibrations and things from the uh, uh, construction equipment that was already on the site caused the building there to, um, the portion of the wall to collapse. So now I'll just show you some context slides. This is looking south on Indiana. So the building in question is, uh, you can barely see a portion of the roof of it there on the right-hand side of this picture. Now we're looking um, on the east side of Indiana at the uh, park space that I mentioned earlier, the Carnegie Park, I think it's called. And now you're looking north at the um, in the west side of Indiana, across from Carnegie Park. And in the distance there, you see Benton Park itself uh, off in the distance. And there's um, two and three story structures uh, on the block there that are all, I think virtually every building on the block with the exception of maybe one institutional building is a contributing building to the um, Benton Park National Register Historic District and the local historic district as well. Here's a map of the southern half of the Benton Park Local District. You can see the little uh, black circle up there at the top is a circle of the building we're talking about today, 3243 Indiana. 
And then here's a, uh, a closer up picture of it. The reason I'm pointing this out is because the building has the date of it uh, on the building and a notation for its historical period. Um, it is a contributing to building to the district. So for example, the building down here with the asterisk is not a contributing building to the district. And I want to testify that this is a contributing building because it's important to the case being made today. So those are the, the images of the building I wanted to show. Now I want to go through the criteria in the ordinance. Um, uh, I'm going to mainly focus on ordinance 64689 because the local district ordinance is based on that with some modifications. Um, uh, so, um, uh, we are uh, charged with making a determination as to um, uh, the significance of the building and based on the historic district nomination, we determine that this is a merit building. It is a contributing building to the district. We do not feel, the staff does not feel it would be a building that would be individually eligible for the district, but it is one of the collection of thousands of buildings in the Benton Park neighborhood that contribute to the historical character uh, of the district. And going through the criteria, criteria A is redevelopment plans. This is not in a redevelopment area. Criteria B is architectural quality. As I said, it's a true, it's a, um, it's a merit building, a contributing building to the local, to the National Register and local district. Um, C, under condition, um, the definition of a sound building is a building that will, the walls and roof will remain standing for six months. I believe that even with the significant damage that this building has suffered, that it would, um, it will continue standing for six months, which would allow time for the rehabilitation of the building. Uh, there is no attached building here, so that criterion doesn't matter. Uh, the next criterion is neighborhood effect and reuse potential. Um, uh, this portion of the Benton Park District, uh, I surveyed it when I was out there. Uh, almost all, if not all, buildings in this vicinity seem to be occupied, and the buildings are what generally in good repair. And I would say the conditions are ripe uh, in this part of the Benton Park neighborhood for rehabilitation and the investment in property. Uh, next uh, is reuse potential. Um, this is a building in the National Register District, I believe. Um, and I'm very confident that it would be eligible for historic tax credits that could reduce the cost of development by as much as 25 to 30 percent in this area uh, for the building, which I think uh, is a very significant number when all the evidence is considered today. Um, uh, I've been presented no evidence of economic hardship. Uh, under E, urban design, um, I would say uh, the blocks here are largely intact, and the urban design of the historic neighborhood is in place. The uh, next criteria um, uh, is that this building um, is not the most ornate structure, I will grant you, but it is a historic building dating from the early 20th century and therefore does contribute to the district. Um, the next criteria is proposed subsequent construction, which is criterion F. Um, the applicant has demonstrated site control. That's for sure they have. Um, and then the next criteria is the pros construction would equal or exceed the quality of the existing building. The proposal, uh, I believe, is for a side yard on the site. Um, so I don't see how a side yard could equal or exceed the contribution of the existing building. There is some language about parking and the expansion of parking in the district. However, I would they are not proposing parking. Uh, and that's kind of would seem to be written more with a commercial situation in mind. Uh, the, the side yard that's being proposed is certainly something that could be allowed under the current zoning. There's no question about that. Uh, the next criteria is commonly controlled property. And I will say that uh, here's, let me read the language for that. If a demolition application concerns property adjoining occupied property and if common control of both properties is documented, favorable consideration will generally be given to appropriate reuse proposals. Appropriate uses shall include those allowed under the current zoning classification, reuse for expansion of an existing conforming commercial or industrial use or use consistent with the presently conforming or adjoining use groups. Potential for substantial expansion of existing adjacent commercial use will be given due consideration. The, this is commonly, con next, there is commonly controlled property here. The owners live in the, in the lot the building to the south and the building to the north is the building we're talking about today. They abut one another. However, I would also point out the commonly controlled property language 
Um, we hear the word commercial um, uh, and industrial um, more than commercial more than one time, and industrial in that paragraph as well. And I don't think the use. Uh, I think when the writers of this ordinance were doing it, they were thinking about the expansion of commercial activities that could include that could increase economic activity, and that really wouldn't qualify or apply to this case. Um, so uh, let me uh, conclude by backing up a step and talking about some of the language in the ordinance. So as we've reviewed a lot of these demolitions, and as the board members know, the ordinance says for a demolition to be approved, there must be of a merit, qualifying or high merit, but there have to be unusual circumstances that are shown. And this is um, an unusual, <laughs> this is, I don't want to use that word unusual too much. This is an interesting situation because actually this is one where the unusual, there's an unusual circumstance kind of on the other side of it. And that is that we have had, our office has had some conversation with the building commissioner and the building commissioner is in a position to reconstruct the southern wall of this building, whether the owner chooses to or not. So if the southern wall of this building is reconstructed, um, then it would be the judgment of the cultural resources office that this building definitely maintains its reuse potential um, and that therefore there really aren't unusual circumstances that justify the use of the building as, or the demolition of the building uh, for a side yard. Um, the other criteria in the ordinance refers to uh, um, whether criteria, a set of criteria are met. And I just want to go through those very quickly. Um, a is a redevelopment plan. We saw that that is not, um, this is not area, is not in a redevelopment plan that calls for the building's demolition. Um, uh, 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 D is reuse potential. I think the building has reuse potential. The area is also an area with significant redevelopment activity. And um, so I don't think that's a real place to go to look for where this is justified. Uh, F is proposed subsequent construction. Under F, the proposed um, new use does not equal or exceed the current use. And there's also uh, no parking being proposed here, as far as I can tell, of a significant uh, amount. And finally, um, the final criteria I'd go to is commonly controlled property. There is commonly controlled property. I could see where folks would think that that's something that's applicable here. But I would also uh, uh, emphasize a couple things. One is that um, there's quite a bit of mention of expansion of commercial uses, which this is not a commercial use. Um, and therefore, uh, that criteria is not as relevant. So to sum up, I would seek that the board uh, did uphold the director's denial. And with that, I'll take any questions. So the the building commissioner that was going to be my question rebuilding that wall. How does that's what he said? No other information. I I'm merely quoting what the building commissioner has said. I couldn't hear that question. The question was so the building commissioner <laughs> said that he could rebuild that southern wall. Okay, and the director said yes. And I don't really have other information regarding that statement. It's just a statement that's been made. The reason for the collapse was due to, according to the owners, due to vibration from tearing down the gazebo. I think that's what they'll tell you during their, uh, I've had a conversation. I think that's what they told me, but you know, I'm always a little reluctant to speak for the applicants, but in this okay, case, I think them. that's what they'll say. Thank you. Okay. Just, just curious. So, if, if the building commissioner of the city built that wall, would they charge the... Yes, my presumption is that they would charge the owner for that. Okay, okay I'm just curious. It's... Anybody else on this side? Thank you. Okay, let's hear from the appellant. Appellants. Thank you very much for your patience. Uh, so I am Jim Gao. Uh, I'm listed, I believe, as a co-applicant, and we have... I'm Holly Neighbor. I'm the owner of 3249 Indiana and the property in question. Is your testimony going to be the truth? Yes. Okay. So we would like to submit into the record a PowerPoint prepared by us. I believe they have it. 
pulled up. Uh, we submitted it to the Cultural Resources Office earlier today. Okay, so first, uh, so the, the, the Cultural Resource Office has, you know, stated that it's a uh, contributing building to the neighborhood. They've shown you the map. Um, it is our uh, position that it, it is a contributing building, but it's not, if you go to the next slide. Uh, there are properties listed in the state of Missouri historic inventory. Um, you can see these are, I just listed the Indiana Avenue of the whole district. Uh, we've got 2600 block, 27, 28, 29, 3000. You get to 3200 block, which this is on. We've got 32, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 21, 31. And then it stops and skips to the 3300 block, which is just south. Uh, I've got pictures of, of the 3200 block properties, which we'll go through shortly. Sorry. Uh, no, go ahead. The next uh, slide is the National Register of Historic Places uh, nomination form. Um, City Block 1524 is the block that this home is located on. As you can see, Carnegie Park is listed, um, which you saw pictures and you'll see some more of. Uh, 3226 to 24, 3220, 3216, 14, 15B are listed on here. Um, notice no 3243 listed on any of these, um, although it is, like you know, the director said, can, listed as contributing. Go to the next slide. Uh, so this is 3200 block facing north. The park is at the end of the street. Carnegie there on the right. Um, if you look to the left really, really hard, uh, you can see the roof line of 3249, which is our residence. Um, and then 3241 to 39 is a duplex. You can see that in the far left background uh, just over the trees. There's a lot of tree uh, street trees on this block. Uh, go ahead, next slide. Uh, so 3259 is on the corner of Utah and Indiana. That is a vacant property currently. I believe it's condemned. Actually, a car hit the back of it. Um, hey. Behind that's a gas station. So uh, 3259 is vacant, but you can see it is red brick, has some ornamental cornice work. Um, 3253, next house down. Um, again, ornamental cornice work, uh, red brick. Um, go ahead, next slide. Uh, there's 3251 and our residence, 4749. Uh, it was a duplex at one point. That's why the dual address, it's a single family now. Um, as you can see on both of these, ornamental brickwork, arched windows. Um, ours has the uh, roof line, the, I, I assume, I, I'm not an architect, but uh, I think that's a mansard, um, or at least a variation on a mansard. Uh, you can see 32. 39, the right, uh, the right picture, that's the duplex next to 3243. You can see in the, the corner of the picture there, the, the proper, uh, subject property. Um, again, ornamental brickwork, red brick. Uh, next slide. Uh, 3235, and you'll see marked E. Uh, that is, the, the marked E is the craftsman designation in the National Historic Registry. Um, so that is character. Derived as a craftsman home, uh, bungalow style it looks to me, but red brick again, um, 3233, red brick. Uh, go ahead and continue. 3227, ornamental archways, uh, cornice. Um, I can't remember. I think this is one of the ones listed in the Missouri inventory. No, it's not. Uh, but again, ornamental brickwork, red brick. Uh, 3221 to 23, that is also characterized as craftsman. Um, red brick on the front. You can see the ornamental uh, above the windows, the inlaid brick and the, the cornice work. Um, go ahead, next slide. Uh, 3219, uh, very similar to the one next to it. Red brick, archway, ornamental, br inlaid brick, uh, cornice. 3215 is a yellow color now, but it is painted red brick. Um, and that is on the registry due to the cornice work. Uh, I believe it's listed as brass and ornamental brick up there. Uh, go ahead, next slide. 3213, same thing, painted red brick, uh, very similar to the house that it's attached to. Um, across the street, 3214, red brick, ornamental. Next slide. 3216, you'll see there, that is vacant, it's condemned. Um, but again, ornamental, 3220, same thing, red brick. Um, and then the last 
couple slides here. Go ahead. Uh, so that one, again, same thing, ornamental red brick. Then the Cherokee Rec Center, which is non-contributing. Um, next slide. You'll see the streetscape here, uh, all the buildings down. So Benton Park would be just behind the photographer. Um, but yeah, that's the streetscape on the north end of the street. Go ahead, next slide. And then here is looking south, or sorry, looking north from the south end of the street. You'll see 3251, 49, the property, uh, subject property there behind the trees. Again, a lot of street trees, and then Carnegie Park. And then next. And so here, as uh, Director Krasnoff said, you know, it's hard to see the, the, the property. Um, so we, we would say that there's, and you can see the street tree pattern. It looks as though um, they're almost uh, unusually dense in front of this property. So there would be a, a limited effect on the streetscape, in our opinion, if it were, if it were demolished. Okay, go ahead, next slide. Uh, so here is the craftsman dis, uh, description from the historic registry. So this is coded E. There were a couple more in the, in the street. Uh, so the greatest number of buildings in this category are two-story 20th century flats, typically four to six bays wide, housing four to six families. Uh, this one's a single family. Um, they, the second paragraph there, segmental and round arched openings. These have rectangular window openings. Um, and then they're replaced by unembellished rectangular openings and cornices variously handled as simple projecting bands of terracotta, no terracotta, or inlaid brick patterning. patterning which there is no inlaid brick patterning on this house. Um, and then we've got a, a tiled overhanging pseudo roof on this one, but it's not tiled anymore uh, due to um, renovations to it over the years. Um, again, this is not a flat. Uh, there's not a projecting front porch with crafts and gabled roofs or anything like that. So it's hard for us to understand why this is categorized as a craftsman um, in the National Registry. Uh, these rehab estimates are based on some online research um, as well as some, the tuck pointing, for example, that line item is um, an estimate that we have a friend that got tuck pointing done on their house of similar size and that was their cost, 30,000. Um, so we've got, if you, you know, you can look at the line items there, roof, tuck pointing, uh, the electrical is completely shot. They actually had extension cords in the property running overhead hanging light bulbs. Um, so the, and the panel downstairs is not up to code, so it would have to be completely, it's basically a completely gut rehab. Our estimated costs on all the re renovations would be about 247, uh, plus some loan servicing to carry the costs. Um, that interest we calculated at 9,200, which would put a total estimated cost at 256,804. Um, the sale of the home we estimated at $130 a square foot, which is generous based on the uh, comparable area homes listed on the right. Uh, 3239 and 3241 are directly next door in one of the, in that duplex. They sold for 129 or 125 a square foot. 3215 is under contract at 123 a square foot. Uh, 2907 Indiana is just listed at 150 a square foot on the other side of the park, a newly constructed townhome. Um, 2801 Indiana is listed at 106 a square foot. 2718 is pending contract at 122 a square foot. Um, these are to illustrate that the cost of rehab um, under the ordinance, which should be taken into consideration, would be the equivalent to total reconstruction. Um, not to mention that we have a disclosure from the sellers that we purchased the property from um, stating that there was prior termite and pest infestation, uh, so we're not sure what problems we would run into as we got into the rehab. Um, the cost of our proposed reuse as a side yard, including the purchase price, the demo, uh, grading, seating, uh, and fencing is $59,000, which um, it's hard to estimate the increase in value to our adjoining property um, because there aren't many comps in the area of a, a lot that size. Um, but we imagine it would increase our property value much more than $59,000. Next slide. And then this is just one block over at the edge of or the corner of Missouri and Utah. There is a quadruple, I think it's actually five, it's three single lots and a double lot, so I guess five lots, um, with this 3251 Missouri on it, uh, just showing that the neighborhood has large lots and side yards uh, like we propose. Next slide. And then the final slide here is the commonly controlled property slide. Um, 
the section of the ordinance. Uh, Director Krasnoff went through it, um, but it is our, um, we're both attorneys, and so we've looked at ordinances and statutes and construction before. Um, so we are reading this as um, if demolition if a demolition application concerns property adjoining occupied property, this does. Favorable consideration will be generally given to appropriate reuse proposals. Uh, appropriate uses shall include those under the current zoning classification. This is allowable under the zoning classification of multifamily residential. Um, it has documented common control. Um, so we do believe that this section applies and we should be given favorable consideration. Uh, we would like to make an objection to the uh, Neighborhood Association, the Building Commission letter. Um, we haven't seen that, um, so we're not sure if there is authority for them to act um, without showing of a resolution from the board uh, officers. Um, we're on the, the Neighborhood Association as well, and so... Noted. Yeah. Um, we do have, so under section 24 uh, of the St. Louis ordinances, uh, this board should consider uh, adjoining property owners. Um, we have a petition that we circulated and we have the signatures of nine owners uh, within 350 feet of the property that would support the demolition. Um, we can submit that into the record. Um, as well as an affidavit from me. That's the original there. Yeah, I've got copies. The affidavit is that you collected the signatures? Yeah, that they were all residents and there are some renters on there, so there's a lot more signatures, but there's nine owners for sure, according to the, the city records. Okay. Um, the gazebo, we didn't apply for the permit, ZNL Wrecking did on our behalf. Mm -hmm. um, it's an ancillary structure. It's my understanding it probably would have been granted anyway. Um, but we were under the impression that it was, along with the garage submitted for a permit. Um, is it your testimony that there was a permit issued or that you thought there was a permit We issued? thought there was one. Like I said, we had no contact with the actual application process. We told ZNL, hey, we want this garage demoed because there was an arson. If, if I had a nickel. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, that's our testimony there. Um, you know, again, according to my, or in line with my arguments on the property, um, Di uh, Director Krasnoff said that, you know, the property itself would not be in individually eligible. It's only because it's a contributing building to the district. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, that's all. Any questions? How did the collapse occur? Uh, we weren't there. We're not sure. From what we were told by ZNL, it was, it collapsed during the construction. During the demolition. Oh, yeah, sorry. During <clears throat> the demolition. When the construction equipment was on site. Right. And we can also represent that we live next door, and when we came home, we had dust and plaster all over our floor, and it was yeah, I have a question. completely remodeled, so Oh, no, that's right. I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, you, you said you've owned both these properties for how long now? We bought 3249 in May of 16, and then we bought this in September. And so what was your original intent? when you purchase these properties for this particular building? So it was going into uh, foreclosure by the city for taxes, and we wanted to purchase the adjoining property. Um, we weren't sure what we were gonna do with the house. We for sure were going to carve the middle empty off onto our property for a bigger yard. Um, and then, you know, this has kind of exacerbated or accelerated the, the process. And so now we're essentially trying to make it <laughs> another, um, add another lot. And last question, I mean, you you were aware that it was you were purchasing property in a historic district. I'm, I'm assuming you knew that. Yeah. OK. And um, the neighbors who signed the um, the petition that they would support your demo. I mean, I'm really binding, but would it is it fair to say they'd probably also support if you said if you passed around a petition saying you wanted to rehab the building? Uh, well, we actually, there were uh, two or three neighbors that said they would prefer it rehabbed, and they just simply didn't sign in support. And so we gave them that option. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there's not like a checkbox that says, hey, what do you want us to do with the property? Um, but 
uh, they were offered that, you know, and they just didn't sign if they were in, you know, not in support of the demo and wanted us to, to rehab it. Thank you. Um, one other question for me, the um, <clears throat> calculation you had for construction costs, did you, I didn't see anything about historic tax credits in there. Uh, no, there, there's not a line item. Eligible for that. Uh, it, I, I, from what I understand and what I've been told it would be, I don't know what the actual, what that means. <laughs> I don't know what the discount, you know, how to 25% take... of what you invest into the property okay. would be eligible, not purchase price, but what you invest in. Okay. Hmm? At, at least, yeah, we've we'll got an expert in the audience. It would be at least $50,000. Yeah. That's a lot of the way these old timers make profits. Well, we still have to come up with $200,000 to rehab it, so. I, th I think that 130 was high for comps. Like the 130 the square foot. Yeah, it was high. I don't think you could yeah. get that. I, I, I know either. that street very well. well. I have a couple clients on. But that wipes out the $9,000. 109 is what we bought our house for. In the, sorry. Well, while, while we're speaking on that, two of, two, three of your line, two of your line items for sure were significantly high. Um, cost to build a garage and the cost of the kitchen and then the cost of tuck pointing was moderately high. Can we see that sheet again? It was 40,000, 40, 40,000. It was 30, 30, 30, 30 for tuck pointing, 40 for a kitchen, and I can't remember what I And 40 for the garage. Yeah, that was just a I've simple. I've also known people <laughs> renovate their kitchen in their neighborhood and it costs 70,000. So yeah. Well, we to, there's currently no kitchen ground. at all. No working there's kitchen. Not well, a single yeah, working I, kitchen or appliance. <laughs> And the plumbing was ripped out of the house, so we have to do all new plumbing. Somebody came in and helped yeah, themselves to the, the copper. Yeah, for sure. Garage could be cut by fifteen thousand. Uh, I would say that was also the case with the kitchen. Um, again, if you're looking at this from a developer standpoint, which is different than if you are living in it and you are going all out um, and probably about 5,000 on the uh, tuck pointing. So I think when you run those numbers, no, when I say 5,000, I mean 5,000 less mm -hmm. on the tuck pointing. <laughs> so 15, yeah. 15, 15, five plus historic tax credits put you well on your way. But again, the 130 square foot is also. Well, really I, under, I understand <laughs> that, but 50, 15, 15, and 5 is 85. And so even if you were at 123 under contract, you, you, it's still a win. It's, like, you live next door, and our house was 106 a square foot. And 109, actually. 109. But, yeah. Well, I understand that, but I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm... We were generous with the numbers. Just yeah, sure. I just yeah. ran times on that a few yeah. months ago. Not in this, on a different house on that same block, and that's high. I, I, again, I'm going with under contract at 123, pending at 122. So let's say that that's the number. Sure. Those numbers, again, with that 85, and I still think that you come out in the black. Okay. And we've got the economic hardship of, you know, generating hundred, even one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to rehab this property is going to be hard to come by. I have a question. And, and and what the numbers that you submit are the numbers that you have submitted. We're, we're just sort of poking at them right. yeah. to try to understand them. Yeah. I have a question. Did someone say something about the building commissioner is going to build this? The wall back up? Have you? Yeah, we to haven't about heard it? about that until seven minutes ago. So. Uh, I was just wondering, is what is he going to charge you, or what? Would you, huh? What or is what in correlation to all these other prices going up there? I don't I, know. I, I, just, I don't think we know very much about that offer, but it, it was introduced as okay. an in, an interesting thing that that, <laughs> that 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 if if in fact we do not uphold this appeal, yeah, they may be interested in okay. or, or not. Yeah. I was wondering. But, but again, um, it's the period of time to question them about the material that they have submitted. Mm -hmm. And if your record is complete, 
I think so. Okay. Well, sorry, I didn't get to ask. So I have one question. So um, when is when was the house built that you want to tear down? 1905 is so what the records are. I guess I saw your PowerPoint, but the ordinance, the, the Benton Park Local Historic District Ordinance says that buildings which are considered contributing on the National Register of Historic Places, which I know you're taking issue with, mm. and or are 75 years old or older are considered historically significant. So, I mean, it is, it meets the 75 year test, correct? It does, but that ordinance is not going to age well. Um, what? It's not going to age well. 75 years, if it was, you know, 75 years today is the 40s. So, I mean, houses in the 40s aren't necessarily historic just because they were built in the 40s. They're just old. Um, that's what we, you know, essentially stand on this, Actually, on this house. Actually, we're, we're learning in other neighborhoods, we're protecting mid-century modern buildings yeah. now un under that same definition. Mm -hmm. And some of the ordinances that have those definitions were created to prevent the construction of further buildings that mm -hmm. look like what we now consider historic. Mm -hmm. by that definition. Well, I think this is a 1910 ordinance, or sorry, 2010 ordinance. This is a brand new ordinance. So I think they contemplated that a house, certainly a 1905 house, mm -hmm. and one even from up to the 40s is historic. Yeah, good point. But I mean, again, uh, his, historic, it is, you know, just it's categorized as a craftsman home. We don't believe, it doesn't look to me, again, not an expert, uh, that it fits that, that style. Um, so it doesn't, as you know, Commissioner Vines so eloquently put, it's built not built of a certain era to re authentically represent a style. Um, I think it may have been miscategorized or misclassified. But the date the date of construction is correct. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We don't. Yeah, we don't dispute that. Anything else you want to introduce? No. Thank you very much, Karen Bodie Baxter. Your name, please. Karen Bodie Baxter, 5811 Dolores Street in the your, city of St. Louis. Will your testimony be the truth? Um, my testimony will be the truth, as I understand. You said something from the chair over there. So what? I thought I'd better get up here and say it for, for the so. record. Um, historic tax credits would be available. State historic tax credits could be available on the renovation of a house of this size. Um, they would not be subject to the cap that we see all about in the news. So there's none of the issues that we're facing with some large projects right now. So they could go in, turn in their application, their plans, their scope of work. And then they, when those were approved, they would get approval and a preliminary allocation of 25% of what would be their qualified costs, which, you know, estimating from what they have there would be over $200,000 worth of qualified expenses. <coughs> so that would be $50,000 worth of state historic tax credits that could go towards a loan <coughs> application <coughs> When they apply, if they were to apply for a construction loan with a bank, the banks do recognize those as an asset for um, figuring out whether or not to give a loan to help do the rehab. So, how, how do you come to know this? Because I have been working on historic tax credit applications here in St. Louis and in Missouri since 1998 when the tax credit law was passed, and I've done over I gave up counting, but I will tell you that I know I have over 400 projects that have received. Their uh, tax credits finish their work on their buildings here in St. Louis. Thank you. Questions for Karen? Do so you know Eric Friedman? Side? Oh, I definitely know <laughs> Eric. I know <laughs> Ben Park. I know everybody. So, I, yeah. I can tell from the look on your face, you do know Eric. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah, I know Eric. Yes. <laughs> okay. But any questions on this side for Karen? Questions on this side for Karen? David? I just, that's a tool that you guys were mentioning, and I want to make sure that they Thank realize you. Tim that's Mulligan. possible. Thank you. Tim Mulligan. I actually just asked a question. Did she talk about anything in particular as an expert? Um, I want to make sure the record's clear. I don't know. I think she qualified as an expert. Okay. Well, we would like to get access to the record. The board as an expert, that's possible. Just trying to ask the question. Noted. Tim Mulligan. Yes, Tim. And attached to Yes. Uh, Timothy Mulligan, uh, 3117 Lump Avenue, a longtime 
Benton Park resident and a chair of the building review committee for 20 years. Have you served on this board? And seven years as a commissioner on the preservation board. Okay. Oh, wow. And is your testimony going to be the truth? Yes. Proceed. Uh, I received a notification that a demolition of to a structure you know, had taken place you know, on this property, and that uh, Alderman Gunther, um, you know, um, uh, Commissioner Krasnoff were uh, immediately you know, involved and you know, maneuvered just to you know, suspend you know, further damage you know, to the structure. And you know this was you know, being you know, treated very carefully as um, uh, the uh, recent owners you know, are you know, active you know, members of the Benton Park you know, organization and involved. And so um, you know through that, um, I think we were respectful. Um, we empathize you know, with their plight. Um, however. Um, this is a historic district, um, and uh, it actually was established in 2006. And you know, much of it was to stem you know, the development or redevelopment um, that really wasn't historically you know, sympathetic or compatible. Uh, one of the other things was you know, some of the um, inadvertent you know, demolitions that have taken place have been done illegally or you know, the guise of an accidental uh, collision with construction equipment you know, to the building. So you know, there have been you know, a few buildings you know, lost you know, over the past 20 years you know, in that vein. Uh, but we generally you know, work very closely you know, with the de de developers you know, just to come up with a, a reasonable um, solution you know, that works for the owner and likewise, the um, the neighborhood. So, questions on this side. Questions on this side. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Alderman Gunther. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, Dan Gunther. Uh, I also live on Indiana, three thousand uh, block of Indiana. Um, and uh, again, I am a member of the Neighborhood Association's Building Review Committee for 17 years and then acting as uh, the alderman over the last two years. And well, I swear to, to tell the truth. The truth. Okay. Yeah. Proceed. So, um, so again, up here, just kind of reiterating a lot that has been said. Um, when I moved to Benton Park uh, 17 years ago, um, I moved there because of the architecture, because of the history, because of the buildings from uh, that were built in the 1890s, 18 uh, uh, or before, or these uh, the ones such as this built in the 1900s. Mm -hmm. um, but we still feel that it is a uh, part of the fabric of our neighborhood to uh, to have, uh, and we're very fortunate to have so many uh, buildings that. Um, have had walls collapse on them, have been falling in, and uh, over the last uh, 17 years, I've seen a whole lot of development in the neighborhood um, without, uh, as far as I know, one demolition really being approved in the neighborhood. Um, as uh, Mr. Mulligan said, there have been a couple buildings that came down on weekends um, that uh, that we were upset about, but, um, but I don't really remember uh, even prior to uh, running for office uh, buildings that were approved for demolition. Um, I also do remember coming to these hearings quite often, uh, speaking against uh, tearing down buildings in the neighborhood. Um, and most of them have, you know, all of them have been rehabbed to this point. So um, I guess I, I will say that I am uh, no stranger to this board uh, coming up here opposing demolitions. <laughs> um, and uh, I think out of the last, uh, uh, three that I may have uh, been up here opposing. Uh, I will say, you know, uh, years years ago, 3001 Missouri Avenue uh, was uh, had an application. They were denied. Um, that ended up being uh, redeveloped, a uh, little cottage house uh, on the alley um, that we were able to uh, uh, separate another parcel of land next to it. So now I have two parcels of land there. Um, the one little, the 3001 Missouri little cottage house is currently uh, uh, for sale for $390,000. Um, and then the 3003 Missouri, which is the little the little cottage house that we, we 
fought to keep from being demolished, uh, sold in May of 2019 for $330,000. So there's definitely a, a market there. Um, another one that uh, the board may remember uh, me coming up and opposing uh, 2913 Indiana Avenue. Um, this was a one room, uh, just a wood frame little cottage house that had the entire back of it was a wreck. Um, we now have a developer for that property. Transform STL is uh, working with cultural resources and our neighborhood uh, board to get the, the uh, drawings approved for that. But um, it's another example of a property that was in uh, quite disrepair. And, and I think during that time, a handful of the board members really asked if we could save anything there. Um, but that is proof that we, are, uh, we have a developer and we're saving that building. Um, we still do have one we're working on, though. Uh, everyone knows 2205 Lynch. Uh, the Stone Cottage building. We are still trying to get the, the owner of that building to uh, to meet with uh, our, she's met with realtors and developers, but we're just trying to get her to uh, agree that um, that it would be worthwhile for her to sell that property and let someone else develop it. So um, so we, we have had successes, uh, but we're also still working on a, a handful of properties. Um, another one, uh, 2322 Gravoy. Uh, it is a uh, 1900 right around 1900s building um we call it in the neighborhood the pockles building um but this is at the intersection of uh gravoy jefferson and sydney street kind of the six-way intersection down there um deagle property or deagle trucks owns it um and they have been denied two demolition permits i believe 2008 2012 um, they were denied demolition permits. Uh, now they have asked me again for another demolition permit, and I've said, no, I'm not going to support it, but they'll be coming up in front of this board, I'm sure, in the future, asking, uh, asking us to decide whether we'll let them tear that building down, which on a six-way corner happens to be the only uh, one of two hisslings um, in this neighborhood. And, uh, and I would like to continue this fight. So. Um, I put up here a picture um, just because uh, I, we've been looking through um, different pictures, trying to get a good view of that side building. Um, of this is the property, uh, the uh, 3243 Indiana. Um, the little gazebo that you could, I guess, if you're looking at it on the left side, you can see part of that structure of the gazebo. Um, originally, uh, you know, they had. Uh, uh, ZNL Construction had applied for a demolition permit for the garage and then a separate one for the building. Uh, they got approved the garage, and uh, but for some reason decided to withdraw the demolition permit for the building. Um, and then when they took the garage down, they decided to come up here and take part of that little gazebo down. And then somehow a giant hole fell in the wall. So, um, but I, we'll leave that as it is. Um, so uh, I would just kind of like to say that, you know, on this block, uh, the house directly north of it, which is a, a, a townhome, a connected to townhome. Um, that one is uh, actually sales pending on it right now uh, at $237,500. Um, so that is within the realms of the numbers that were put up there of what it would cost to rehab this building, uh, as well as 3215 Indiana, which is just uh, maybe four or five doors north of this building, uh, which was on the market for $500,000. So I think if you look at the numbers and you look at what it would cost, uh, to rehab this. Um, there's definitely a market uh, for houses in the neighborhood. Um, you know, one of the other things that was brought up about the having additional green space or side lots, um, you know, as, as the applicants mentioned, they live uh, directly south, but there is a, a full size lot in the middle that they could carve out and then you know, put this as a separate parcel of land and sell it off to someone that would want to develop it if they don't want to. Um, I also find it interesting that um, you would be looking for a 50 foot side lot when we have two blocks of green space across the street from you and six doors north of you, you have 14 acres of green space, which is Benton Park. So um, so I know obviously you don't have a fence around it, but, uh, but they could potentially have a, a, an additional 25 foot lot um, on the side of their house and still keep this building. So um, and I guess it was uh, brought up about, uh, uh, you know, questioning the letter from Tim uh, Mulligan, the neighborhood. Um, so I would like to put on record that I also questioned this petition. Um, I believe one of the names on there is Kevin Hampton, who lives at 3349 Indiana. I spoke with him today and he said, I don't remember signing anything. I would never want a building torn down. So I think if you're going to look at that petition and say, oh, well, nine people that live next to it say fine. Um, speaking to Kevin Hampton, who was, uh, you know, was on the block or on the 3300 block of Indiana today, 
day, uh, he did not recall uh, supporting tearing down a building. So maybe he signed for something else, but uh, but he said, I would never support tearing down a building. It's, you know, it's the fabric of our neighborhood. So, um, so yeah, I will kind of leave it at there. I would just ask that the uh, board, um, you know, not let them tear down a building, which uh, in this picture from, I believe, September 25th of 2018, looks like it's a perfectly fine building to me. Um, so, uh, and then all of a sudden a gazebo gets torn down and there's a hole in it. So we'll leave that as it is and let uh, Frank Oswald and Rich Sikora work out the rest of it. So, Questions any questions for me? Thank you. Thank you. Anything else for the record? <laughs> and Daniel Krasnoff, I still swear to tell the truth. A uh, couple points I want to make. Um, one of the hallmarks of uh, historic preservation and the designation of historic districts is that buildings are a record of their time. Um, some historic buildings, um, some old buildings are highly ornate and have lots of dramatic detail. And some of them are more plain. But um, the building you see uh, in this slide and in the other slides I showed is a record of its time in the Benton Park National Register Historic District. And this is one kind of building that was built by the people who built that neighborhood at the height of its development as a community in the late 19th and early 20th century. So I do not believe um, that the fact that the building is somewhat plain in its design diminishes its contribution to the historic districts. It is a record of the history of the neighborhood and as such has value as a contributing building uh, to um, the district. I wanted to also clarify something that the alderman made reference to and that is that um, there was one other building, there was one other permit on this site recently and that is um, within the last 12 months there was a permit that applied for the demolition of this building. I didn't make that clear. Um, that was canceled or withdrawn, however you want to say it. Um, so there was a demolition permit that was approved for the garage, a demolition permit that was canceled for this building within the last 12 months, and a demolition of the gazebo without a, without a permit, just to clarify um, that. Uh, and I would also state there was a reference to some buildings in the neighborhood having many empty lots in their adjacency. Well, um, there were probably historic buildings there at one time that got torn down, and that's a loss for the neighborhood and a small loss for the integrity of the district. Every time a contributing building is demolished in a historic district, it loses, a, a, you know, assuming it's not a giant building, it loses some percentage or some part of its integrity. And the loss of this building would mean the loss of that integrity, and that's why it's considered a merit building. And that's why that's important. Um, uh, finally, I'd just like to reiterate, there's a hierarchy in the criteria uh, in the ordinance that they're in order of importance. Uh, the commonly controlled property criteria, which is the criteria that they've mentioned that I think, you know, I could see the board thinking that that, um, that is uh, an important criteria, is criteria G. It's the second lowest criteria. Criteria B, which is the second highest, is the merit of the building or the, the quality of the building, and this is a merit building. So by that, the, a, B building should, a B criteria should trump a, uh, a G criteria. There aren't unusual circumstances that have been documented uh, in this case. And I think the discussion has shown that the numbers presented um, are not done in an expert fashion. And even if they were, there is still a, um, with the consideration of historic tax credits and folks on the board who are expert in the field of, of neighborhood or, or building revitalization, those numbers are quite suspect, and it looks like the building probably could pencil out as a potential economic rehab and does have, therefore have reuse potential uh, under the ordinance. Thank you. James or Holly, do you want to add anything? Um, you're still under oath, or affirmation, or promise, <laughs> or whatever, oh, it, whatever it is you said. <laughs> Um, so there have been 24 demolition residential permits granted since 2006 um, in the Benton Park Historic District, according to the City of St. Louis data. Um, Where one of those pictures? It's, you want to shoot anything else? Oh, and the the ordinance it doesn't specifically state the level. The you know A B C D doesn't mean A is most important. It's just subsections. I didn't see any reference to a hierarchy of. Um, 
importance. If I'm wrong, correct me. That's, can I, yeah, that's absolutely can I fine. To that? Sure. As, as long as we're not going to spend more than an hour doing it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it'll only take 45 minutes. Uh, yeah. um, <laughs> Shoot me. In ordinance um, 64832, let's find my place here. Um, Commissioner Richardson, can you find it faster? I'm looking. Under section five, it says all demolition permit application reviews pursuant to this chapter shall be made by the director of the office who shall either approve or disapprove of all applications based upon the criteria of this ordinance. All appeals of the decision of the director shall be made to the preservation board. Decisions of the office or board shall be in writing, shall be mailed to the applicant immediately upon completion and shall indicate the application by the office or board of the following criteria, which are listed in order of importance on the basis as the basis for the decision. I'm wrong. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> Anything right. else? That's it. Okay. <laughs> Commissioners, that concludes the testimony in this appeal. Commissioner Richardson, have you got a motion? Um, yes. I move that the preservation board uphold the director's denial the demolition because the building um, does not satisfy the criteria of the ordinances that were introduced into record um, and is a merit building and contributing resource to the Benton Park Historic District. Second. second. Okay, motion has been made and twice seconded. Hmm. Who, were, who were the seconds? Melody. Okay. I might have been third. Adana, get that? <laughs> okay, thank you. Discussion? <clears throat> I I'll say one thing just really fast. I know everyone wants to get up. I just think that when you um, uh, purchase a property in a historic district and you know it's a historic district, it, you have a level of responsibility um, to be stewards of that property um, that preceded you and that hope, hopefully will succeed you after we're all gone. And I think that's very, very sacred. No harm in asking, though, right? Correct. Okay. Um, um, I have something. Sit down. Go. If you want to go first, though. Uh, well, yeah, you, you so, first, I'll let you. Okay. I, I, I am. I am concerned that it would take heavy equipment. to take down a wooden gazebo. Um, well, if you were taking down the garage and then the equipment was already there and rented and you thought, you know what, I'll just take down that gazebo <laughs> and possibly the back wall. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Hmm. <laughs> we're, we're not we're not adding this to the record no, and, I know, okay you 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 sat through an you sat through an entire meeting so i'm 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 allowing some latitude <laughs> to to have this discussion yeah okay commissioner colleen um well, I guess I just wanted to state um, that a lot of work went into um, the designation for this district um, to preserve what's there. I know that because I was part of the group that did that. Um, and I understand, I, you know, I live in this neighborhood too, and I understand wanting to have a side yard. We live on a lot on Sydney Street where we're, our neighbors are 30 inches away. And we've always thought, wouldn't it be great to have, you could have a pool or, you know, do whatever. But I guess in the end, we've, come to terms with where we live. It's, it's a neighborhood of old homes and uh, it, it's, it's got a style to it. And as uh, Commissioner Vine said, we also realize that we're stewards of this neighborhood. We're just passing through. And if we needed more land, we could move out to Chesterfield or wherever. And uh, so I, I just, I think it's important to remember that. Um, and, and, but I do respect, I mean, you guys are homeowners, you own this building, you should be able to do what you want with it. This is America, right? However, you're, you bought in a historic district where you, it's filled with building huggers, like who would like tie themselves to this building before they let you tear it down illegally. I mean, I'm serious. They will. 
So I respect your, your, your desire, but I just wanted to explain the history of where we are. I, I would like to just add to that that nobody wants Tim Mulligan tied to their building. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that would be awful. <laughs> For, further discussion, commissioners? Okay, hearing none. There is a motion on the floor. It's been made and seconded. I'm going to do this by roll. Commissioner Vaccaro, do you vote yes or no? I'll pass. Commissioner Vines, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Hamilton, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Colleen, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Richardson, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Robinson, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Fathma, do you vote yes or no? Yes. Commissioner Vaccaro? Yes. Commissioner Vaccaro votes yes. That is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven yeses. Commissioners, you have upheld the director's denial. And we now move to agenda item I. Commissioner Richardson, do I have a motion on agenda item I? Yes, uh, I move that, because we're skipping H, I guess. Mr. Chair, may I just say that my earlier remarks were, uh, I'm told the truth and I will continue to tell the truth. Commissioners, you have heard the testimony in this matter. I have, by the way, never watched us before. I, I, yeah, that's I, I, I commend everyone except myself for your good work. Commissioner Richardson, have you got a motion? Uh, can I have one question? Uh, so this is a true and correct copy of the, an accurate copy of our proceeding? Best of my knowledge. Was a good environment for redevelopment investment. The building uh, had reused potential 
part because it was eligible for storing tax credits, which would reduce the cost of redevelopment. There's also testimony of neighborhood reuse, that neighborhood effect and reuse potential by Kerry Cody Baxter, a historic consultant, who said that historic tax credits uh, were available. There's also testimony uh, by members of the board in their professional capacity that some of the costs stated by the applicant uh, were high in their professional opinion. Therefore, the testimony and the evidence before the board was that there was neighborhood effect and reuse potential. And if there is reuse potential um, building, uh, then it should not be demolished. Under criterion E, urban design, Mr. Krasnov said the block is intact and uh, the historic urban design of the block is in place. Uh, and that, again, it was a contributing structure, although not the most ornate building, it was a contributing structure under the historic district and from an urban design standpoint, should then not be demolished. Back to criteria D, sorry about this. The alderman of the, the ward also said there is a market for rehabs in the neighborhood, also showing the reuse potential of the building. Criterion F was proposed subsequent construction. Um, there was no subsequent uh, proposed construction um, proposed. The uh, applicant said they were going to use it as a side yard. Uh, so there was no use uh, of it for, constru for construction. There's no use of it for parking. It was going to be a side yard. So uh, that does not weigh in favor of uh, demolition. Criterion G was commonly controlled property. Mr. Krasnov testified that the house in which the owners live is adjacent to it. But again, in his professional opinion, the commonly controlled property criteria really relates uh, to commercial uses, not residential uses, and he also noted that this criterion was second from last importance of import importance. The ordinance says that the criteria A through uh, G, H are supposed to be applied uh, in uh, with the A being the most important and carrying the most weight in uh, making our decision. The last criteria was criterion H, which is accessory structures, which Mr. Krasnov uh, introduced evidence that it was not applicable and, not, and so that uh, so not, neither supports demolition or uh, not approving demolition. So based on those criteria and the weight and the factors uh, of, of, of them, uh, I move that we uphold the director's denial of the demolition and find that uh, the applicant did not meet the criteria for demolition state. Is there a second? Second. second. Who seconded? Alan. Alan seconded. Barbara, are you confident you have the motion? Um, I do believe so. Would you like me to? No. <laughs> okay. No, I, I take your assurance that you're confident that you have it. Commissioners, we have a motion before us. It's been made and seconded. I'm going to call a roll. Commissioner Allen, do you vote yes or no on the motion before us? Yes. Commissioner Hamaker, do you vote yes or no on the motion before us? Yes. Commissioner Hamilton, do you vote yes or no on the motion before us? Yes. Commissioner Colleen, do you vote yes or no on the motion before us? Yes. <coughs> Commissioner Richardson, do you vote yes or no on the motion before us? Yes. Commissioner Robinson, do you vote yes or no on the motion before us? Yes. Oops. The chair votes yes on this motion. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven yeses. The motion carries and the appeal is denied. Commissioners, do we have any other business to discuss? Hearing none, do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Commissioners, <laughs> adjourn. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>